Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, I got two o'clock by my time. We always get a few stragglers coming in afterwards, so we'll go over the house rules uh, to allow people some time to join. We ask that you please turn your camera on uh, if you're part of the committee, uh, and we please also ask that you mute yourself unless you are speaking. Uh, if you do need to uh, address something on the side, please turn your camera off in the meantime uh, and turn it back on when you're ready to be part back part into the meeting. Our note taker for today is Erica. Our subject matter experts will be John and or Robbie, uh, depending on the proposal there. Um, we will have a timer for those of you in the general public that would like to speak. There is a timer. You will have two minutes to speak your mind uh, initially. And then if you want to rebuttal, you'll have an additional minute after um, it goes back to the committee. Halfway through, we'll take a five to 10 minute break just so we can all do what we need to do, go to the restroom, answer emails, phone calls, whatever we need to do. Um, today, you should be able to see, today we're going over the IECC uh, items, which are listed on the screen. Hopefully you can all see that. If you will at this time, if you can see the agenda on the screen, please raise your hand <clears throat> virtually on, on the computer. Uh, we ask the general public do this as well, because this is the way that we are able to communicate with each other and allow each other to know if you want to speak up. So general public, this is your time to raise your hand as well. Uh, if you can see my agenda, please raise your hand or just raise your hand in general. <laughs> you don't have to necessarily see the agenda. Looks like everybody else has. So while those hands are going up, please keep those up. I'll go over briefly the Roberts Rules of Order. For those of you who aren't familiar, for the major majority of the agenda, we will follow these rules. However, uh, there is a little caveat with the introduction part of the proposals. But uh, how it's going to work is that the proposal is introduced by the moderator, which is myself. Uh, we will ask the proponent to give us a summary of the proposal. From there, we will go to the general public and ask if anybody wants to speak in support of that proposal to raise their hand. You'll have two minutes to speak your mind. Then we'll go to anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition. You will also have two minutes to speak your mind. From there, we go to the committee to ask any questions about the proposal. After all those questions have been asked, uh, that goes back to the general public for any rebuttals and support for a minute, and then anybody that wants to speak uh, as a rebuttal in opposition for one minute. From there, we go back to the committee uh, for any motions, and that could be a motion to modify, a motion to approve, a motion to disapprove, et cetera. So those are the, the rules. I see hands have gone up, that's great. Go ahead and lower your hands, and uh, we will get started. So, I'm going to skip roll call real quick because we aren't voting yet. Uh, so Erica, please hold hold tight on that, but I'll jump to item number two on there. And item number two, these are just introductions of these proposals. We are not going to be voting on them. However, we are going to allow uh, for some public comments uh, and then also for the committee to ask any questions about these. So. A little bit different than the, the rules that we just explained, but um, those two items, again, are going to follow a little bit differently. Introduction of those, uh, then we're going to ask uh, the proponent to speak on them and give us an update. So remember, there, there are about five key proposals that we talked about that will affect, uh, that, that take the majority of the savings that the city is looking for, or I guess the majority of the savings uh, of all the pr pr proposals. So these are two more of those five. So they are very important. Uh, this is your time to pay, it, pay close attention and get all your questions answered because they're, they're being introduced right now. Uh, but we will not vote on them today. So the first one uh, is item number P39, and I believe that's Christine. Uh, uh, excuse Christine, me, Mr. Moderator. Please... Excuse yes. me, Kevin. Yes, this is this is Eric Browning, uh, building official for City of Denver. I, I apologize uh, before we begin uh, the introduction of uh, these first couple of items. Um, we actually wanted just to take a couple of minutes or maybe longer um, to to speak with this committee and to uh, acknowledge, uh, quite frankly, the the fact of where we are 
uh, in this committee process with the hearings um, for the, the IECC and the Green Code, not, uh, the Green Code Energy uh, items, um, our, our progress or, or lack thereof, and a lot of the feedback um, that we within the city have, have received. Um, and I, I will say that it's been um, you know, both um, supportive, but also you know, constructive criticism, which is always welcome. And uh, I will absolutely acknowledge that um, we have faced uh, a, a number of challenges uh, with you know, working our way through um, you know, discussing having specific information available um, or even having um, you know, the, the right folks uh, in the room and in the meeting available to answer some of the specific questions that come up. Um, obviously, many, if not most of you are here because you are subject matter experts that offer uh, insight and value. You have experience um, that is much broader and beyond um, you know, what, what city staff can offer um, you know, in and of ourselves. So I want to begin by acknowledging that, but also to thank you and, and acknowledge the appreciation that we have for your participation in this process. Um, it, it has you know, it does not go unnoticed or underappreciated. Um, and we recognize that you're volunteering your time uh, to participate. That being said, and understanding some of the, the real and understandable frustrations around discussing and quite frankly, developing some of these proposals on the fly in these meetings, uh, we want to acknowledge that with this being um, the, uh, what do we have, the fifth or the sixth of uh, nine meetings that we had scheduled, uh, it's, it's not going to be possible to get through, um, quite frankly, even the, the top 10 or the, the top 11 uh, critical proposals that we've been talking about as a committee uh, in these last, you know, four meetings, this one included. And therefore, the, the city has, we, we recognize that, um, and we're going to uh, push the pause button for a very brief time to evaluate how we can best approach uh, working with those of you respecting your time that you've already committed, respecting the time of the remaining uh, hearings as well, um, but looking how we can approach um, collaborating and identifying the information that we need uh, to, to advance those, those major proposals, those, those top 10, if that is in fact what uh, you know, the committee believes uh, should happen, if, if you know, the committee feels that there are fatal flaws in some of these that simply should not be approved, then, then the committee will, will bear that out a little later down the road when we do get to voting on, on some of these, which um, as Kevin just mentioned, isn't the intent for um, at least those, those top four today. Um, so, so that being said, um, as I mentioned, the, the city is looking to um, evaluate ways that we can approach uh, the last few hearings or, or some other uh, you know, avenue a little bit differently um, so that we don't lose any of the progress that we've made, but also in recognition that um, even though there's nine hours in the last three hearings and we've got the rest of the one today, quite frankly, that's nowhere near enough time to develop what we need to to the level of accuracy um, that we need to for you know these these top ten. So, with that being said, um, I want to pause for for just a minute. Um, I'll ask any of the other um, city city staff team members that uh, we have on this call if there's anything that I've missed. I, I probably have, uh, and I apologize if I did. But please uh, jump in if I missed anything. And then after the other city staff have an opportunity to to speak. I would, I would value, we would all value if there are any opinions you have about, uh, you know, an approach we could take. We're, we're brainstorming, but, you know, we value uh, everyone's perspective if there are any opinions you have about an approach we could take on kind of these, these top 10, top 11. Um, you know, let's take a few minutes and I'll, I'll take down some notes 
um, and we can go from there. So um, I'll, I'll shut up for a minute and uh, Christy, I'll let you go ahead and jump in. Yeah, so all I wanted to say it just underscores what Eric said. Like, I think that we have two primary goals. The first primary goal is to advance the codes as effectively as we can in pursuit of the community's goals that they've brought to us and asked us to serve. And then the other is to use your time effectively and efficiently and fairly and in a way that lets everybody feel confident that what we're advancing is fully thoughtfully created and will actually serve the goals that we're hoping to serve. So um, so that's our goal. And um, that's just underscoring what Eric was saying. I think you know the reason that we're all on this committee is we because we recognize there is critical value to advancing these provisions, and I believe we we all feel passionately that we want to do so, you know, correctly in the in the right way, um, without setting ourselves up for uh, you know failures in the future just by forcing language through or for that matter, disapproving proposals that, you know, maybe do have legs that just needs a little further refinement. So um, with that being said, um, let me pause for just another minute. I would love to hear from, from any member of the committee if you have an opinion about um, a variation in the approach, something that is different than the, the uh, format of, you know, these uh, committee hearings that we've been following. I'm certainly open to that, and if if not, that's okay. We can just transition on into the the first um, you know residential proposal item. And and that's fine. And so uh, what I will say is that the city will be communicating internally over the next number of days, and um, we will absolutely be communicating and coordinating um, with all of the committee members. Um, to clarify what the best path forward is um, to look forward to the success of as many of the proposals as, as we can. So I, I see Elizabeth, you raised your hand. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Eric. You made me think of a question. Um, it, I, is, is the committee being tasked with uh, achieving these, these Denver goals no matter what? Or is the committee being tasked with trying to find what we think is uh, acceptable or achievable by the community or somewhere in between? Excellent question, Elizabeth. And the, the answer is that the aggregate knowledge and expertise of all of the different committee members that are here today, and, and quite frankly, some that are not present that can offer really substantial representation from different perspectives, can help guide the, the language of these proposals. And I don't answer that intentionally vaguely. What I'm, what I'm saying is if we feel like the language as it's presented, uh, is is good and can be implemented and there are not you know either code language or practical barriers to implementing that um, or, or any other questions that we might have we, we don't want to leave unanswered questions um, if we feel like the language is good then you know we, we should you know vote our voter conscience for the purpose of trying to advance these provisions keeping in mind that you know part of the goals here are to um, you know, advance towards the goals of Comp Plan 2040. Um, these are, you know, energy specific provisions that are driving us in that direction. So that's, that's all good. That being said, I, I will not sit here and advocate that all committee members vote to approve something if they don't believe that it should be approved. I, we, we invited everyone to participate so that they will speak their mind and offer their professional perspectives. And so if we feel like there are there are flaws, whether they're fatal flaws or minor flaws, we should discuss those as, as part of the process. Um, and that's, again, part of the reason why we need to hit pause and kind of step back because this whole discussion um, that has become quite different from what past hearings have been, um, you know, it's, it's almost uh, code writing by, by committee, which is, uh, you know, 
I certainly value it, um, but it takes a lot more time than simply hearing and voting on, you know, completely developed proposals. Um, so that being said, um, we would like to see the provisions advanced if we as a committee are of the opinion by majority vote that um, they, they should be advanced for, for the greater good of, of the community. Um, if we feel like by majority, it's not something that, that we should be doing or we're for whatever reason shooting ourselves in the foot with the language as it's shown, then that's a different perspective. So um, hopefully I was, hopefully I've answered that question for you, Elizabeth. It, it's not intended to be a non-answer. Christy, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just gonna layer on, I mean, from my perspective, it's, it's everything that Eric said with an emphasis on, you know, if, it, if we don't like what's in the proposal, it's an extra layer of thinking about, is there a way for us to make it so that we think that it's approvable? And, and so there's that extra bit of work where, like I think standard code process, we don't work so hard to try to find the path to making it approvable. If we're able to try to find that path to make it approvable, it serves the community's goals and everybody wins. And so that's, that's why we're having the extra dialogue instead of just saying, well, this proposal isn't good, so let's vote it down and drive on and, and okay, we're done. It, it's a little bit more fraught than that because so much more is at stake because the community is asking us to try to find the path. Thank you, Christy. All right, I don't see anyone else's hand up at the moment. So, uh, oh, there's Elizabeth, she's back, okay. Sorry, me again. Um, I think a follow-up to that is, you know, if, if the committee is either, you know, finding a way to meet the, Denver goals, or if the committee feels like it's too far reaching, how do all of these amendments then get calibrated? So, you know, all these things like R406 and R408 and C406, things that we have to vote on today, how, how do all the numbers in those get sorted out in a way that, I guess, aligns with what the committee feels is achievable? Am I, am I asking that clearly? You are, yeah, and I see uh, Courtney is prepared to respond here. I will mention that um, I don't think it's actually our intent that we may not choose to vote on R406 and 408 today just because we recognize that there is likely additional work that's necessary for these, and we don't want to force the committee into a vote on something that is uh, essentially, you know, undercooked, uh, and then potentially force a vote on something that's not approvable when perhaps we could take it away and then come back at another time on something that is much better. Uh, Courtney, go right ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so Elizabeth, to answer your question, um, the calibration of these proposals like C406 or R408, those would come after the conversations we're having. So today we'll be going through these proposals um, we do really want to understand where the committee feels that that level of stringency should be and then work on that framework for that, but then the calibration would come later. So, um, you know, if we were to vote today, we wouldn't be voting on the calibration, we'd be voting on the framework and the approach to that, but then understanding what other proposals pass and where the committee feels that those um, levels of stringency should be, that calibration would come towards the end. Again, we're going to revisit this process, so that might be a little bit different, but we wouldn't be talking about the cal, we wouldn't be voting on calibration. So I, I guess that's where I'm not clear is, I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario here, but what are we calibrating to? I and mean, I understand that you're trying to calibrate all of these together to be equivalent, but what is the metric that we are calibrating to? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, these proposals are set up right now to meet the goals and the net zero energy implementation plan. If the committee feels that um, we need to balance that a little bit differently, then we can calibrate that differently. So the points wouldn't be potentially as high or the credits would be modified in a certain way. Or if another proposal passes, sometimes that affects you know, the C406 proposals. So there's a lot of factors that would go into that. So I mean, I'm hearing that the credits are written with the bar right here. So does the committee not have influence on where the bar is set? No, we, we absolutely do. Yeah. And, and how is that? 
um, in a uh, part of the process or does that not occur within the committee? No, I think that that's what these discussions are for, um, you know, as we've been listening and then we'll go through these today again um, about, you know, when we get to our 408 where we'll see the credits as they're laid out. Do we think that that's appropriate as a committee? So that that is open to discussion. I hope that helped clarify that a little bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there anyone else that has any uh, any questions or, or comments or anything to offer in terms of anything that we've said thus far? Pretty open-ended question. All right, uh, Mr. Moderator, I will uh, gladly turn it back over to you. Apologize for uh, interjecting earlier, but that was an important part of our conversation this afternoon. So uh, back to you and thank you very much. Well, thank you. I, I also wanna say thanks to the entire committee uh, for their, their commitment, but also, you know, that a lot of people uh, get to thank the committee, but not not too often does anybody thank the city. So I also want to thank the city for what they're doing. I mean, it, it truly is a testament to the city's commitment to, the, to our industry. You know, some cities don't even go through this process, let alone allow things to be, you know, modified or changed up um, to make sure things are done in the best interest of the community. So thanks, everybody, including the city. Uh, all right, so let's go over to P39. This is partial space heating electrification. And Christine, uh, that is yours. So I will bring it up on the screen. And if you would, please give us a summary on this proposal. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Can I share my screen? Oh, sure. So you want to share it instead. Okay, that's fine. Yes, please. As, as, long, as, it's, uh, as long as it's the proposal. And um, I, I guess I would be cautious if you're sharing statistics uh, that's not part of like a, a overall summary. <laughs> I have a, a broad summary and then I'll pass it over to Sean who will uh, dis or, or you'll display the actual text. So I'll provide more of the, the context. Okay, uh, then go right ahead. Okay, um, you need to uh, allow me to do screen sharing. Yep, you cannot I just start. Have to stop mine. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, and there we go. So again, I'm Christine Brinker with Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, where I work on high performance homes and buildings, uh, especially policy around that. I brought a visual aid today. Our air source heat pump and heat pump water heater, this was our pandemic project. We didn't learn to bake bread like other people. Instead, we put in uh, all electric heat pump systems. And the reason for this proposal is to allow more Denver families the benefits uh, that we're getting through um, highly efficient, super clean, super comfortable heating and water heating without all of the hassle that we had to go through for retrofitting an old system into, into electric. So that's the point we are aiming to reduce and eventually eliminate emissions from residential heating and water heating in a way that's cost effective and efficient. And we're going to, we're proposing to do that through heat pump based systems. So some things to consider. Uh, fortunately, this is much simpler than the commercial proposals since uh, the range of uh, design for houses is, is still big, but is a lot smaller than uh, the different types of commercial applications. Um, this is absolutely, as you know, most cost effective to do at the time of new construction compared to retrofitting it later. I have a couple notes on costs in a minute. It makes sense for new construction to lead the way. And finally, it's necessary to meet Denver's goals of net zero in uh, new homes and buildings by 2030. For the performance, it's rapidly advanced just in the last few years. And now cold climate heat pumps are available down to minus 22 degrees. Um, so it's debatable if you even need electric strip heating at that point. Mine goes down to seven degrees. It's not a cold climate one. Um, but the strip heating hasn't even needed to turn on in a couple of years. Uh, and we absolutely love it. But performance, in other words, for cold climate is no longer a key consideration or a barrier. 
As for the costs, there's potential for overall cost savings. Your mileage may vary. Um, we're finding slightly higher equipment costs upfront, uh, though those upfront costs are are decreasing as more and more contractors are getting familiar with putting heat pumps into residential situations. Um, you do save on the gas connections either to the home or within the home or both. And that's where you get the overall uh, net positive economic benefit when you look at the whole picture over there. Plus these systems are, are in most cases uh, cheaper to run over time. That didn't used to be the case, but now that natural gas prices have risen, uh, that's what we're finding. Our, our bills are lower and the other studies are showing something similar. But again, your mileage may vary and that's not the case for everybody. I wanted to mention more on the cost side uh, since that might be a key consideration for the committee. We think that rebates from Excel would still be eligible, would still be allowed. They would be for higher efficiency systems um, not not just any heat pump system. Right now, they range from 800 to 1,000 for air source heat pump, 2,000 for ground source heat pump, and somewhere between 600 to 800 for heat pump water heaters, depending on your configuration. Let me know if you want more details there. The rebates are expected to increase because of a bill that passed last year. And then there are rumors Excel is considering some incentives for, uh, for an all electric version of their new home performance uh, based on Energy Star new certification. That's still rumored. Um, and uh, another thing under development is a 10% tax credit at the legislature for heat pump and heat pump water heater systems. It's, it's uh, making its way through the Senate and heading over to the House in the next week or two. Contractor trainees are significantly ramping up again through Excel and through other um, entities. And then finally, on the cost side, uh, there's an ongoing PUC docket that's looking at uh, uh, removing subsidies for new gas connections to, to houses. And that, again, would shift that cost equation between electric and gas. So uh, I think, um, yep, um, last, almost the last slide, this is no longer cutting edge. They're, they're pretty standard. Um, now the sales are increasing, but there still are a number of market barriers that this would help address. And I can speak from experience that it's pretty difficult to change your heating and water heating system after the fact. So it's so much easier just to do it right the first time. We don't want new homes that are outdated in a few years, and we don't want new homes that are completely incompatible with Denver's climate objectives. And just like last time, we are absolutely interested in the committee's feedback on how to make this proposal workable. Um, we understand nothing is perfect right out of the box and we would uh, love to hear your suggestions for how we can make it work while still meeting the same intent. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sean to uh, uh, go over the specific wording of the proposal. And I, th I think Kevin, you might bring it up on your screen in this case. All right, thank you, Christine. So as you look at the language here, you'll see that the language is very similar to the commercial language, however, that we looked at last time around, but it is simpler because the applications for space heating in residential, which in Denver, to remind you, is single family homes basically, is simpler and more straightforward. Um, so what we have here is a modification to the existing heat pump supplementary heat language that is in the code right now. Um, and there's two parts to this. One is that it captures uh, any gas supplementary heat that might be included in the design. And then it just reorganizes it to align it with the way that the commercial language uh, talks about supplementary heat since it's um, a little bit more comprehensive and explicit. And you will probably notice that these are very similar to what we discussed for commercial. And then when we get to the actual requirement, we have that heat pump space heating, space heating, again, for new buildings. This is, in this case, we have, we did make some modifications based on the um, electrification working group uh, as, as much as we could. So this is only for new buildings. It wouldn't apply to existing buildings going through for equipment replacements. 
would need to be provided with an electric heat pump system. And there are a series of exceptions. You'll notice a couple of these exceptions probably strictly aren't necessary, um, but we feel like they would be useful for the market just for really, you know, um, boneheaded clarity, really, when it comes down to it. Um, so, you know, solar thermal, waste heat, and energy recovery systems. Uh, it does allow for up to 1,000 watts of electric resistance heating per dwelling unit, and this is meant to just allow for that spot heating that you might want in a home, whether that's a, a bathroom floor or a heat lamp or, or something like that. It also includes the, the resistance heating elements integrated into heat pump equipment. Again, this might not strictly be necessary, um, but just in case, we want to be absolutely clear that if you have a heat pump like mine that doesn't have electric strip heat, it actually has electric resistance built into the compressor itself to provide additional heating, that that is allowed. And then it does have that ex exception for the supplementary heat when it's in accordance with the, um, the section that already exists. So since this is a little bit more straightforward, we don't need to worry about um, central systems since we don't have any multifamily in uh, subject to the residential code. And um, this really addresses primarily the same circumstances that are covered by the Energized Denver ordinance for electrification retrofits. I mean, those are, there's a high level of overlap here. So those that would have been required to do retrofits in 2024, I believe is the date, is when that goes into effect. You know, this is that type. Um, so if this doesn't go through, I guess that is one thing to note is that any piece of equipment, of gas equipment for space or electric, for space or water heating, we're not talking about that yet, but uh, any piece of, a, of gas equipment for space or water heating that goes in to a new building today will only be used for one equipment life cycle because the ordinance will require that it gets replaced with electric at the next equipment replacement. So any questions? Okay. So thanks, Sean. Uh, before we get to, to questions from the committee, uh, just to keep some order, I will first go to the general public and allow anybody from the general public I um, to speak for two minutes. Kevin, sorry, Kevin. Yep. Um, Jan was going to present a little bit from Caster as well before moving on. Oh, okay, great. Um, and I did also just want to clarify um, something that Jan and I put in the chat is that Energized Denver wouldn't apply to single family homes. Oh, so I, I apologize. <laughs> we talk about it so much that it makes sense. Thank you. All right, Jan, take it away. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I do have some slides. Uh, so who, whoever's sharing, thank you. And I will, you've already seen a lot of these, uh, so I'll keep it rather quick. Um, you can see that, all right. Uh, hi, everyone. Jan Kelleher, Building Electrification Specialist in the Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. Just a brief background on renewable heating, cooling electrification in the residential um, context in Denver. Uh, again, when we talk about gas use in buildings in Denver and our climate zone, vast majority, 97% is from the two uh, end uses being discussed today, water heating and space heating. Less than 3% is coming from these miscellaneous uh, uses like cooking and clothes drying. We're really talking about heat pumps in these proposals, which are two to 300% efficient uh, in our climate zone. And 100% efficiency is based on a source that creates heat, whereas heat pumps move heat. We wanna highlight that zero emission electricity is coming. So uh, Excel Energy has proposed to be at an 80% renewable grid by 2030. So well within the lifetime of any heat pump installed within this code cycle. We see actually very significant differences in the lifetime carbon emissions of a new home being built in 2023, whether it's all electric or mixed fuel. And this is a much bigger difference than on the commercial side because homes tend to use more gas for space and water heating. Uh, so it's, it's actually less than half uh, 20 year lifetime emissions to build all electric today. We often talk about the electric grid and whether or not I can handle building electrification. Today we have a significant summer peak, around seven gigawatts, and pretty significant headroom to electrify 
wintertime electric end uses. And, you know, in Excel Energy's modeling, the clean energy plan, um, you know, once you have kind of like very deep penetration of heat pumps, where 73% of commercial spaces, 62% of residential spaces are heated by heat pumps, that's where the winter peak starts to approach looking like the summer peak. We, we've heard some concerns around product availability and the feedback we've heard from manufacturers and distributors is that heat pumps are distributed where code requires them because the demand there is well known and understood. And we are seeing instances of Denver installers sourcing product from areas like Seattle because Seattle already has a code that requires heat pumps. We're also seeing significant especially recently volatility in gas prices, and whereas electric prices um, are largely much more stable. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes here talking about the cost differential compared to gas. Um, so for the res this was um, a study, a liter literature review conducted by Brendel Group for us. And uh, for the residential side, we had a lot more sources than the commercial. There have been about five different distinct studies that have looked at um, the, the upfront and operating cost of single family home electrification. Um, we kind of see a variety of things here. Um, so looking at an all electric home, we do see that it can be constructed cheaper upfront um, or you know, around $850 less compared to a mixed fuel counterpart. So call it at cost parity or less. One of the um, dynamics that's in, in, important to point out here is, is we do see a bit of an inverse relationship between how much you spend up front on the efficiency of the system versus your future operating costs. So um, the more you spend up front uh, where you're, you're maybe at parity with a mixed fuel home, you're likely to see about the same or reduced operating costs for an all electric home. But if you spend a lot less and sort of, you know, by the Corny study saves $6,000 on the upfront side, you might see some higher operating costs up to an extra $350 a year. I will note all these studies were conducted uh, before we saw pretty significant uh, gas commodity prices increase of 50%. Um, and then for space heating specifically, we see either cost parity or some additional costs. Again, that's going to be, that's going to have different impacts on operating costs in the future. And same with water heating, uh, some additional upfront costs, but largely reduced operating costs um, just due to the efficiencies uh, of heat, heat pump water heaters. Last uh, two weeks ago, we, we discussed some of the uh, incentives and resources we hope to provide uh, to support uh, developers and folks that want to build all electric, uh, things like sample mechanical designs, demonstration projects, um, trying to tackle equipment availability through methods like bulk purchase agreements, and then just a lot of education resources is something we've heard as a need in the market. And again, we're seeing this kind of policy really um, kind of be extremely uh, kind of, I wouldn't say common, but it's being taken up a lot of different places across the country. I think over 50 cities now in California have moved um, to require all electric in some form or another. And, and in most cases, virtually all cases, that includes single family residential homes. Thank you. Okay, so I think now uh, I have the ability to turn it over to the general public, uh, just so everybody's aware how we'll do this because it's a little bit different than how we normally do. Uh, we'll ask anybody from the general public that wants to comment or have questions that are in support uh, to raise their hand, then we'll go to opposition, just so we know what side of the fence you're on on that. Even though you might be on one, you might not be on either side of the fence, pick one side for now so we can uh, keep that straight. So anybody from the general public that wants to speak, uh, please raise your in support of this or have any questions or want to uh, just chat, um, please raise your hand. First hand up is Maggie. Maggie, uh, please introduce yourself and I'll put a timer up. You'll have two minutes. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. 
Excellent. Um, my name is Maggie Thompson, and I work for Denver City Councilman Joel and Clark, who is unfortunately on spring break right now. So he's not able to be here himself because this is the kind of stuff that he gets very excited about and nerds out a lot on, as many of you have seen over the years. Um, I'm just here to remind everyone today we're very supportive um, of proposals like this one. And, and Christina's worked with us on Green Building Code and Energize Denver and all of these other things going on, but just a reminder that this will eventually have to be um, voted upon and approved by Denver City Council, and it's it's imperative that uh, the document brought forward to Denver City Council um, has at least the same equivalent of electrification requirements as those previous um, green building projects that we've worked on. We we really don't want to be in a situation where it is even more incentivized for folks to scrape and rebuild. Um, you know, we don't want it to be more punitive for folks to have um, to have higher standards when they're retrofitting buildings as opposed to uh, building brand new buildings. Um, I can't be like Christine. I can't sit in front of my new um, mini splits personally here right now, uh, but they are super cool. And, um, and and a lot of this technology is coming on the market and just that encouragement of um, let's put these requirements in place. Let's get more of these products on the market. Let's get those costs down um, and let's bring a really great package to Denver City Council so that they can approve it and move forward and we can hit more of those CASR goals and more of those climate change goals. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for the time um, serving on this group. I know that it is uh, a thankless task and lots and lots of hours um, and it is very much appreciated by me as resident of Denver and by Denver City Council. So thank you again. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Lindsay. Lindsay, please introduce yourself and you'll have two minutes. Hey everybody, my name is Lindsay Rasmussen. Um, and I am here representing myself today as a resident here in Denver. Um, I just wanted to tell everybody that um, about my journey um, buying a home recently, I started looking and, um, you know, I felt very restrained on my budget. I'm a young person. I'm, I'm 27. And, um, you know, I, I just felt very restrained and, you know, I'm, I'm, I wanted to be very climate conscious um, and, and, you know, acknowledge that the actions that I take have an impact on this climate. And um, I was very lucky um, when I first started this process, I thought that finding an electric home would be extremely expensive. Um, I ended up finding a community of new builds um, and it's an all electric community. And um, I just moved into my house this last weekend and I love it. I'm obsessed with it. And, um, you know, it has all electric heat pumps, water heaters, everything is electric. And, um, you know, I, I feel very blessed. And I think the biggest thing that I want to, and it's totally up to date with the 2021 IECC codes. And I think the biggest thing I want to say is that this is a community of people around my age, I would say. Most people are young professionals um, or young families. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not an extremely wealthy community. And, you know, I think there's a misconception in a lot of people's minds that you cannot have an electric home. And it, you know, if you, unless you have a lot of money and that's not true, every single home in this community, um, which by the way, they're all very nice, um, was built for under, four, for under $435,000 depending on the finishes that you got. Um, so, you know, the, the lowest price that you could have gotten was about 1300 square feet for 330,000, I think. Um, so I just wanna really emphasize that affordab affordability point and just let everybody know about my experience. So thank you all for letting me chat today and yeah. All right, thank you. Next up is Ginny. Ginny, please introduce yourself and you'll have two minutes. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenny Wilford, and I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to each of you as committee members for all of the time that you volunteered to be a part of this group, um, building out this next set of building codes and, and listening to all of these different proposals. 
so I wanted to share my experience uh, retrofitting my home, um, moving away from gas to an all electric home. Last winter, a few days before Christmas, unfortunately, the furnace in my house completely died. And my husband and I had been wanting to get rid of gas and move towards electrification, but we just weren't expecting to have to do it so quickly. Um, so we did what most consumers do. We um, got quotes for a new system that used gas and one um, and a couple of quotes for an all electric system where we were, you, where we were using a heat pump. Um, and we were really surprised that the cost to go all electric was essentially the same as um, the cost of, of using gas, a system that used gas. But the one hidden cost that we encountered and were surprised by was for the electrician for the wiring. Um, so I, I also just wanted to quickly mention that instead of keeping gas as a backup, we opted for heat strips, which have been really awesome. Um, and that said, I'd suggest that supplemental um, supplementary heat should be limited to electric resistance since we're talking about new construction and there really is no need to use gas as a backup um, when the technology is already there. Um, but I'm chiming in today because, you know, when when you all of this committee um, considers and hopefully approves this amendment, you're ensuring um, that you're saving future homeowners and renters money by not having to pay unexpected retrofit costs by having lower monthly energy bills and improving our future air quality. And I guess the last thing I would say is that, you know, the decisions that Denver makes um, around building codes. Um, really have an impact on decisions made throughout the metro area, um, you know, and, and I think the ones that you all are considering are huge and really exciting. Um, so when you do adopt this proposal, um, the metro area will absolutely reap the benefits. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Next up is Miera and Miera, hopefully I pronounced your name right. Uh, sorry if not, but uh, please introduce yourself and you'll have two minutes. You did, thank you. Um, my name is Miera Fickling. Um, I am a resident of Denver. Uh, currently my husband and I rent in the Baker neighborhood, um, but we are starting our search for our new ho first home and uh, looking to stay in the city. Um, we're pretty young, we're concerned about climate change. We try to make responsible decisions. Um, I drive an electric vehicle, so it's really important for me to have an efficient and all, all electric home. Uh, in addition, we're cost conscious. Uh, housing is really expensive in Denver, uh, especially given the price increases in the past year. So, you know, I think our first priority is to find a home that we can afford. And it's really difficult to find an all electric home in Denver. And we're worried that we'll have to settle for a gas home. Um, if we purchased a gas home, we'd be interested in renovating it to install a heat pump and heat pump water heater, uh, but that would be a lot more expensive than simply just purchasing uh, all electric from the start. Um, and I'd be concerned that it might not be feasible right away. Um, so uh, for this reason, I'm really supportive of uh, the space heating electrification proposal. I think it'll um, increase choice for those of us in Denver. Um, in addition, natural gas bills um, are very high this winter and I think it'll uh, help protect us against uh, that volatility. So I uh, just wanted to come out and uh, express my support. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have Sean. Sean, please introduce yourself and you'll have two minutes. Perfect. Can you correctly? Oh, did I? Can you we, hear me okay? We can, we can hear you. Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Lamont. I do work for Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC. Uh, bring some personal experience to the table. Um, first, to address the concept that um, there are many people saying that uh, heat pumps do not work in cold climates, I would say that the distinction there is that there are different categories of pumps and uh, looking at it climate heat pump is the right application for our climate uh, with some options. Um, I know many systems have been uh, comfor comfortably operating down to and well below typically referenced five degrees and even negative 13 degrees outdoor temperatures that you'll see documentation. Um, I, have a, I have seen them operate at negative 22, negative 25, uh, et cetera. 
um, and those are above spec, and that has to do with the quality of the planning, the quality of the installation, and how the system is operated, and nuances of the house. Um, I have a colleague who uh, wishes that they undersize their very capacity heat pump in their typical 1920s uh, Denver brick home uh, because uh, they would like to We lost the audio on Sean there. Sean, can you hear us? Okay, well, we'll move on. If he, uh, if he comes back, we'll give him his 40 seconds back <laughs> that he can finish up, but we'll move forward to the next person, which is Sarah. Sarah, please introduce yourself and you'll have two minutes to talk. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah Sneed and I'm here today as a resident of Denver. Um, so first and foremost, thank you uh, to the committee for the opportunity to provide comment. Um, I will keep it pretty brief since I know you're hearing from a lot of folks today, um, but I am here to support this proposal. Uh, I'm a renter here in Denver. Um, I also have asthma and I know from personal experience that renters don't always get the opportunity to choose the heating and water heating systems in their homes, um, especially not low to middle income renters. In most cases, renters don't know if the indoor air quality of the places they live and work is good or bad. And unfortunately, gas appliances release many of the same toxins as, for example, car exhaust um, inside our homes. And so, Starting with nearly all electric buildings with highly efficient electric appliances can dramatically improve air quality and ensure more equitable health outcomes for everyone in Denver. So um, just here to express my support um, for this proposal and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right, um, let's go back to Sean. Sean, uh, you have about 40 seconds, 45 seconds left, but uh, you got your audio cut off. Um, I don't know if you want to try again. See that you're still muted. You should be allowed to talk. Give you one more opportunity here, Sean. Okay. Uh, seeing that that's not working, that's fine. Uh, we will now move to the other side uh, of the general public. Anybody that wants to speak in opposition for two minutes on this proposal from the general public, please raise your hand. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition of this, please raise your hand. Third and final call, anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition, please raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, I will turn it back over to the committee. Committee, this is now your time. Again, we are not voting on this, but this is now your time to ask questions about this proposal to the proponent or to the city. Uh, first up, we have Ken. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Quick question for you. This is on R403.13. Just the um, wording there where it says heat pump space heating. I know we talked about this with the commercial one a couple of weeks ago. I think the intent is for this to be all heating. And so I would recommend that the, the underlying bold portion just say space heating. If it's then going to drive heat pump um, heating, I would hate for a designer to just assume that that section is only relevant to heat pumps and move on. So I think you could clarify that by saying space heating, and then it would say space heating a new building shall be provided by electric heat pumps. I think that's a great clarification for you to consider when we go to both this. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Chuck. Oh, yes. Um, looking at the space heating R403.13, it is um, requiring a heat pump. And could we also get to the same result by maybe requiring a certain level of um, space heating efficiency, which wouldn't preclude new technologies, is my thought. And looking at the exceptions, the exceptions um, possibly could leave out um, new technologies or like geothermal is not on the list. Um, so just clarification on that or maybe have a, an exception that is general, like pro prohibiting on-site combustion, but allowing other new technologies to come on. 
And then just a specific question for the from for the proponent on R four hundred three point one point two number three, the thermostat malfunctions. I'd like to hear more on that. How that um, how you envision that working? Like if thermostat malfunctions, what kicks on to provide the heat? Um, it's just an it's an interesting exception. And then where did the twenty degrees come from on the outside air temperature? Or my group of questions on this proposal. Sure, so I can go through them and if I forget any of them, let me know and we can circle back. So the first question about specifying an efficiency level, um, this has been structured the way to require heat pumps because of uh, federal preemption. So federal law that sets equipment efficiencies, um, not only does it set a minimum, but it also means that states and local jurisdictions can't set any equipment efficiencies higher than that. So we can't just say it has to be a COP of whatever, um, because then we could run afoul of federal preemption. So this is kind of the way to thread the needle of federal legislation. For the exceptions, um, geo, like true geothermal, um, yeah, there's not an exception for that. Ground source heat pump, which a lot of people call geothermal, would fit into this because it is a heat pump. Um, I think, does Denver even have true geothermal potential? Um, so if there's, but we have an alternate means and methods. If it turns out somebody, you know, finds a hot spring in their backyard, um, they could always be approved through alternate means and methods. Same thing with new technologies that achieve the same intent of this, which is providing a certain level of decarbonization. Um, through electrification could always be approved through alternate means and methods. Um, and that might be the cleanest way to do it, uh, but certainly if there's another way to, to word it that uh, certainly someone who's a code official enforcing this stuff might find better. Uh, certainly, I, I think that we would want to think about that. Um, for the thermostat malfunctions, uh, that's because depending on the thermostat, sometimes the fail safe is to turn on the supplementary heat. So when you have a thermostat that is, um, you know, there's two ways to do, there's a couple ways to do supplementary heat. One of them is with a thermostat that actually controls both systems. And when the thermostat fails, some of them are programmed to fail to a safe, which means turn the heat on and don't, and just run it. My thermostat, which is not a hybrid, um, it is just a heat pump, if the, since it's wireless and battery powered, if the batteries run out, it just turns on the heat and the heat runs. Um, and that's its fail safe position to be in. So that makes sure that a thermostat with that kind of fail safe to protect property and people is allowed under these control strategies. And did I miss any? I think I covered all of them. Uh, 20 degree temperature. 20 degree was in, in discussions um, leading up through the energized Denver task force process. 20 degrees was just identified as this kind of a, a handy threshold that, you know, while it's not when all heat pumps might, you know, need supplementary heat, it's kind of a, a good place. And we definitely don't want some heat pumps are actually can be configured to fail over to their supplementary heat at higher temperatures than that. So we want to make sure that they're at least getting down to 20. I mean, really, ideally, you would want it to get even lower. And a lot of heat pumps will go lower than that before they would go to supplementary heat. But we want to make sure that they're at least getting that low. All right, next question comes from Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm interested to hear um, from, from Christine or, or anyone else more related to the uh, cost of installation in, in new, new construction. And um, I'm, I'm struggling a bit to uh, understand um, essentially the, uh, the, the cost as has been presented as being perhaps equivalent to or better than in, in some cases um, that of, of gas. And I'm not 
sitting here advocating for, for gas, but it seems to me that if electric heat pumps were a better economic option, a lot of people would be installing them already and our market would have them. So I, I need to better understand the disconnect between what's being presented in terms of the costs and what we actually see in reality. Yeah, I have a few thoughts on that and John might as well. Um, I, the reason we're not seeing the market uh, instantly take over to fix this problem is that contractors are generally unfamiliar with heat pumps and uh, are more comfortable putting in what they've traditionally put in. Um, and uh, that's gradually changing over time, but that's the main reason. Um, also for retrofits, it's pretty challenging. And so uh, contractors tend to shy away from that. Sometimes you might need a whole new duct system. Um, since, uh, and so that's, that's another reason. Um, also, uh, the state of the technology and the advancements in the technology hasn't necessarily made its way out in terms of education and outreach to the contractors. For instance, we got, oh, five bids and six, seven, I can't remember. And a lot of them, um, had no idea that that heat pumps could supply heat in our climate. They just said, "There's there's no way you can do it. They just don't work in our climate, um, and they don't know the rapid performance improvements that have happened in the past few years, um, where they can go down to those really low negative temperatures." And I think those are efforts that are underway, uh, both in the broader market by manufacturers like Mitsubishi and, and Daikin and Carrier, and then also now increasingly with Excel, providing more and more contractor training. So, so that's it's kind of an information lag there. Um, and then the other disconnect I think you see in terms of costs for, is it more expensive? Is it less expensive? Part of that is contractor familiarity. We saw, for instance, some contractors had a $10,000 difference between other contractors in the bids we got. And that's just because they're not used to putting in the systems. So they, you know, wanted to cover themselves. The other main thing is that in new construction, where you really get the savings is by not having to pay the gas connection, um, either from the street to the house or within the house, uh, connecting up the gas appliances. And we found those to be uh, nearly $3,000 in each case. So sometimes where the upfront costs for the equipment might be more for a similar heat pump versus a similar high efficiency gas system, um, you make up those cost savings, you, you make up those cost differences when you uh, don't have to pay for the gas connection. Um, and then again, making up some of those costs in the operating costs over time. And it used to be, it depends how you configure it. It used to be more expensive for the electric option, but now with gas prices having risen and going all over the place, um, now it's coming out where you'll get some cost savings. It, it's not dramatic. And that's another reason the market isn't taking a mass movement over there, but you do get savings over time. I appreciate that, Christine. I, I would like to just ask the follow-up based on the, uh, I'll call it the comparison with the installation of, of gas um, from the utility itself. And because these proposals are talking about, um, you know, our space heating and our water heating in the next proposal, um, there's, there's always a question that comes up and we would be, you know, want to ignore it folks want a gas stove for some reason. Um, and we all know that there's good reasons not to do that, but uh, for those that do, or for those that have uh, gas as a supplemental or a backup, um, we've completely eliminated that savings from having the gas installed. And for my question to you then is, um, you know, does that then essentially negate um, or probably just extend, um, you know, the payback period for those heat pump systems if it's not like an all electric house. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, you summarized it right. Thank you. So to, to that question, I think that because of the market factors that Christine talked about, um, it, it can kind of muddy that cost question a little bit. When we did a, a cost study on electrification in New York State, so another cold climate, but not the same market. So, you know, it's illustrative rather than truly representative. But electric heating with a heat pump from a first cost standpoint was actually cheaper. So when you just get to cost of equipment, cost of labor, it's cheaper. But then you see some of those factors that Christine was talking about where contractors will charge a premium on top of what it actually costs to do it because it's a new technology or because they don't wanna do it. You know, Sometimes you see that from contractors, they, they put the, I don't wanna do this premium on it. Um, so I think the, the key thing is even without the infrastructure savings from the hookup, it can be and it should be cheaper to have all electric heating. Um, but because we are in a market transition period right now, some contractors, it won't be. If this becomes mandatory, that um, murkiness in the market that results from contractors being able to do things to get so that they're not doing heat pump installations, that will quickly be reduced and eliminated. All right, next question comes from Aaron. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's not really a question, it's more of a general statement. Uh, I'm, my name is Aaron Esslink. I'm a product manager for Excel Energy with the Business New Construction Rebate Programs. I just want everyone just to be cautious of what we are putting in all as mandated um, because our rebate programs are set up in a manner where we can only incentivize customers to go above and beyond code. And when things are written into code, that we do in a lot of affordability kind of testing and kind of different cost spends and stuff like that. Excel Energy incentives might go away or they'll be greatly decreased if we do start mandating everything. So I just want everyone to be cautious of, of the stuff that we do do put in there and realize that some of that money that we are saying that helps out the costs from Excel Energy aren't always going to be there with, with some of those repercussions. So thank you. Okay. Can, can, thank I, and can um, I make a comment to that? Sure. Yeah, thanks sure. for bringing that up. And that's something we were carefully considering all along in the hopes that all Denver residents would still be able to get the heat pump incentives. And I, the reason I think they will is that this proposal does not specify an efficiency, but Excel's uh, rebates do. For instance, um, insulation is required in the code, but you can still rebate higher levels of insulation, uh, et cetera. And I think that's comparable here. Um, the technology here would be required, but you could still incentivize higher efficiency systems. Okay. Great, thanks. <clears throat> All right, next question comes from Chuck K. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I, have, I have three things. Um, first, um, originally it, it had electric resistance as a supplementary backup and that was crossed out to make it more generic. Um, I, I certainly don't think we should support uh, having fossil fuel backup, natural gas backup. I mean, when we're talking about new construction, there should be a big uh, cost advantage, cost savings advantage uh, by avoiding the whole gas infrastructure. So. I would think uh, the reasonable backup to have would be electric resistance. And, and I, I certainly know of, of homes that have heat pumps in, in Colorado that have no backup, um, but I wouldn't think we'd want to incentivize gas backup for a heat pump system. So that, that's my, my first uh, comment. Um, the, the, the second one is um, solar thermal is given as an exception to using heat pumps. So of course, any solar thermal system is only going to provide a, a portion of the load. Um, it, solar thermal systems require a backup of some sort. Uh, again, I would I would oppose allowing gas as a backup uh, for solar thermal. Um, I suppose uh, if it's a large solar thermal system, 
you could say, well, it's going to heat the house most of the time. And so maybe electric resistance backup would, would be sufficient. We wouldn't have to put in a heat pump. Uh, but on the other hand, I guess you could also argue a, a smaller heat pump with electric resistance backup would be a possibility. So I guess um, I'm a little curious about uh, the solar thermal exception. Again, I, I would not want to allow gas as a backup. And, and finally, I, I agree with what uh, I think Chuck said before. Uh, 20 degrees is a pretty high temperature to switch to electric resistance backup for today's cold climate heat pumps. Uh, most of them can, I, I would say, easily go down to five degrees Fahrenheit outdoor temperature uh, without uh, having the coefficient of performance drop to a point where, uh, or the output drop to a point where uh, electric resistance backup would be needed. Can I make a short response to that? Yeah, sure, um, thanks. Chuck, I, I totally agree with you there uh, as to using electric resistance instead of gas for backup, especially since we're talking about new construction here. And I would be supportive of, uh, of amending the proposal in that regard. So thanks for bringing that up. Maybe a better case could be made for gas supplementary necessity for uh, replacements, which is not what we're talking about here. Uh, but for new construction, uh, I would agree with you totally. So I'd be amenable to that. I, I, I would pass it over to Sean for the th solar thermal mm -hmm. question. So this, there is actually an argument to be made that you don't even need to include that exception for solar thermal. This is one that was included just to be absolutely um, explicit that this requirement does not prohibit solar thermal systems. If you look at the way that the supplementary heat um, requirements are set, they're only allowed for heat pumps. So you wouldn't be able to do supplementary heat that's not a heat pump to solar thermal. You would have to, if you had solar thermal that can't cover your load, its backup would have to be a heat pump that might actually have a backup that's something else. So, you know, it's because of the way it's, it's phrased, that's how it would have to work. Um, the 20 degrees, was the result of stakeholder conversations. If this committee feels that a lower number, and that I also should note that, you know, these conversations started like two years ago, a year and a half ago. So if this committee feels that that number should be lower and that we are ready for a lower number at that point, I think that that is perfectly reasonable. Uh, the last part about, and one of the public comments also brought this up is why to allow natural gas as a supplementary heat source. And that came from discussions with the building department during early development stages. So again, we're talking about a year and a half to two years ago where they, ha they did have some homes come through whose volume was large enough that they didn't think that the heat pumps would actually be able to meet the heating loads on their own and that gas was a necessary for these certain large volume homes. Um, and so this was, since this was a new requirement, we felt that having some kind of accommodation for that was reasonable, especially when you think about the expense that would be involved in doing supplementary gas backup in new construction is itself a barrier and that might be sufficient. If large volume homes, and if it were just like, rich people houses, I, I probably wouldn't care, but large volume homes could also be multi-generational houses. And I do care about that. Um, if, if we feel that, th if the committee feels that the technology is in a place right now, that that's not necessary, that um, concession is not necessary, then its elimination would be totally reasonable. I, I would say that, that Mitsubishi and others have cold climate heat pumps available in commercial sizes now. Uh, which should be able to accommodate a very large home, I would think. And of course, you could always install two three-ton units or something like that. One other short right. comment on that, if I could, uh, before the next speaker, about the 20-degree limit. Even though cold climate heat pumps are available, uh, the bids we got were slightly more expensive for cold climate heat pumps. It's essentially a trade-off between a higher upfront cost for cold climate and then cheaper costs when the climate, when the temperatures get cold. 
Um, and so we kind of made a compromise to say, maybe it's not going to get cold that often, <laughs> especially when global warming. Um, and so having the 20 degree limit in there, it does, as opposed to lower, it does allow a little more flexibility in that trade off between upfront costs versus operating costs. Yeah, I mean, I would think operating costs could get pretty high um, if you don't have a cold climate heat pump because your backup electric resistance heat would come in a lot. And in yeah. that case, yes. that would really raise the, uh, the electric bill. Exactly. Thank you. All right, next question comes from Christy. So my question ties back to the conversation about cost and availability of equipment and um, and installation uh, knowledge. And I guess I'm wondering if one of the members of the CASER team who's here would want to talk a little bit about some of the work that's being done on the side of um, seeking to negotiate bulk purchase agreements or work in conjunction with DITO so that the familiarity level in the installation community increases. Uh, I guess it would help to know and have some perspective of what's being done to support that side of things. Yeah, Jan, do you wanna um, hold up that slide that you had? Yeah, sure thing. And uh, Tom, if you're on, if you want to run through this, he's been focusing um, really closely on developing these uh, electrification incentives. So I'll pass it to him. I don't, oh, gosh. Um, I don't think I have, have too much to add beyond just like, the, you know, we've been having stakeholder engagement meetings um, to identify what types of incentives are, are needed and how, you know, what are those soft spots and how do we help shore that up? Um, so this was, yeah, this was kind of the end result of that. Um, you know, we haven't really started uh, to to have those, you know, to like initiate a bulk purchase agreement or work with local distributors. Um, those are just those were identified as opportunity areas. Um, so you know, that's those are the paths that we want to go down to be able to provide that support. Um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. I'll oh, open to additional feedback. Um, you know, we're we're just early in the process on on these incentives, so really haven't uh, haven't gotten too far down any of these paths. But this is what we plan to offer, um, and as new challenges arise, we you know we hope to have new resources to meet those. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, and yeah, there's so there's these four items here: the sample designs, demonstration projects, um, equipment availability, and educational resources. So meeting with small subgroups, um, some of you may have been on some of those meetings as well, just brainstorming what we can provide um, to our community. What does the community need um, to help move the market forward? Um, so hearing the questions about availability, working um, to, to figure out if we can do bulk purchase agreements. Um, so we're strategizing on these now, we'll be developing these further um, and then um, detailing them so that we can start to um, provide electrification incentives moving forward. And maybe I can add a little bit on the strategy with Dito, because um, you asked about that, Christy. We have a green job strategy, and we've had a RFP. Last year, we had an RFP out for good green jobs and hope to do the same this year, where um, Energy Efficiency Business Coalition and uh, the International Center for Appropriate and Sustainable Technologies are both providing training specifically for heat pump installers. Um, and then um, Christine alluded to a lot of the work Excel Energy is doing in this space as well. Um, they've put on a number of multi-day trainings on how to sell heat pumps and how to install them. Thank you. Next question comes from Elizabeth. Yeah, hey everybody. So um, not surprisingly, I still have a lot of the same concerns for these two proposals as I do for the version uh, in the commercial code. Uh, but I also wanna remind the committee that this does not just apply to single family homes. 
Uh, residential buildings include um, single family, of course, but also uh, detached townhomes uh, and group R3 and R4. So uh, you know, all the conversations have been about a house here, uh, but this is gonna extend a lot more than just a house. Uh, and it can be dwelling units of many sizes uh, and budgets. So you know the 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 uh, amendment proponent who who is happy about the four hundred and thirty five thousand dollar house, I don't find that to be an acceptable number for affordable housing. Um, and I uh, I don't love all of the discussion that's putting all the blame on our contractors, our local contractor community. Uh, I don't think uh, that's fair. Um, and if we're going to say that it's less expensive, we need to be able to prove that it's less expensive instead of just assuming that it's it's somebody's fault and uh, that that they're making it more expensive and that as soon as we pass this code, it'll magically be less expensive. I just don't buy that. Um, there's so many other things that go into uh, the designs of these systems that go beyond just equipment costs. You know, you get into some of these non-traditional um, building types. And if I'm not a 2000 square foot home, do I have space for a heat pump water heater? Do I have to have a split system? Why can't I use a PTAC or a VTAC? Um, PTACs and VTACs, your cutoff is going to be 40 degrees. So are you intending to preclude the use of those in smaller dwelling units, especially for R3 and R4? Um, the thousand watts of electric resistance heat is that for um, is that fair for a small dwelling unit? Is that fair for a large home? Uh, should that be um, applied to radiant heating? Should that be applied to forced air heating? Should that be applied to freeze protection? Uh, you know, there's there's just so many things that still need to be thought out through here, um, and I do really really worry about mandating this. So uh, the, uh, the Excel rebates is a big question because part of what Excel is trying to do is to create a rebate that encourages fuel switching. So if we mandate electrification, that removes that potential. So whether uh, you know, a, a homeowner or a builder chooses um, a, a base efficiency heat pump, uh, there could still be a rebate potential if that's not a mandated thing under what um, what we hear that Excel is trying to do. Um, and so mandating this could, well, it will have a, a rebate potential and reduce the cost effectiveness even further. It's more of a statement than a question. Okay, next question comes from Nathan. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I uh, I do want to second some of the things that Elizabeth is saying. Um, I'm I'm seeing uh, you know in projects that are going on right now in single family uh, and townhomes that we're looking at anywhere from I'd say seven to ten thousand dollar price add for going from traditional gas equipment to uh, a heat pump system, um, and I think to um, I, I do want to make sure that we're clear on this, and Elizabeth brought it up, the inclusion of stacked multifamily um, into the commercial code was done by an amendment in the um, adoption of the 2018 code. I have not seen that same amendment in the adoption of the 2021 code, or is Denver looking to make some large building like code policy change to make that a permanent addition to the code? Um, having, yeah, having a clear definition on what is or isn't under the residential provisions of the IECC would be great. Um, and that is all that I had. Anybody from the city want to chime in on that? I can, because I think Eric had to step away. Um, that the baseline actually does incorporate that shift in the residential definition. So there's not a new amendment because we took the updates from the last amendment cycle and put them into the baseline. So that is actually incorporated in what would move forward for adoption in 2022, for 2022. Okay, thank you. Next to, up is Antonio. Uh, oh, to, sorry. To Elizabeth's Nathan, and Nathan's point. Or Sean. I'm sorry, it's just to Elizabeth and Nathan's point about non single family R3 and then R4, uh, it might be helpful if the city could comment on 
how many of those go through so that we can understand how big of an issue that is. They, they are kind of odd building types, but that doesn't mean you don't have any. Yeah, this, this is Eric. I, I can't provide a specific number. Um, it, it's certainly small compared to the overall development within the city on an annual basis. Um, but what that uh, percentage is or what that quantity is, I, I don't have the data in front of me right now. Okay, uh, something to consider maybe next time we hear the proposal. Next question comes from Antonio. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, as we know, one of the biggest issues associated to these heat pumps is the capability of the pump and the volume. Uh, my question is, um, in all the research that I've been able to find, is that the more that we're going to use these at a higher temperature or lower temperature, these things could be running all day. They could be running literally 23, 24 hours a day. Um, and I guess it's a two-part question um, associated with the cost as well. Um, yes, the unit could be cheaper, but then we also, again, the volume, we have to deal with changing out our duct system, which could be a substantial cost. How do we effectively deal with the homes who they were maybe not built to have all the thermal envelopes addressed and all of a sudden we're just gonna put a heat pump like it's a magical solution? Um, that's my first question. The second question um, is for our gentleman with Excel. Um, if I understood him correctly, are our citizens of Denver losing twice? Are we losing not only on the rebate, then we have to install ducts and the pump. So do we do we keep losing in this thing? Because as it's my understanding from what he said, they lose the rebate and they have to put in the system. So those are my two questions. So to the first question, this is only new buildings. The the language only applies to new buildings. So retrofits um, wouldn't be captured under this. So having to change, you wouldn't have to, there wouldn't be a duct system that you would have to change out for something like this. Um, but you would qualify for the rebate if you did it. So if you wanted to qualify and everybody's perception is, hey, these heat pumps are great, let's do it. And all of a sudden they put it in, but they don't qualify. So, and not to interrupt you, but I just wanna make sure I'm understanding this proposal correctly. So it does require a heat pump. Right now, Excel's programs require, they give incentives for above code heat pumps. This only requires a code level heat pump. So unless Excel makes the decision to get rid of their heat pump program, then projects would still be eligible for above code heat pumps if they, which to be honest, that's what most of the heat pumps are that's, on the market. I'm sorry, that's not what he said. He said that, and I get not to interrupt you, but he said that if we were to put this into code, that that would then be the level playing ground and thus that rebate would be, it would be gone. That's what I heard from that gentleman. Is he still on the line? We can maybe get it from Excel themselves. Yep, yep, I'm still here. Um, we would be able to incentivize some of the higher efficient products. Um, however, right now there, there's no mandatory thing to put a heat pump system in. So I feel like the rebates are a bit inflated compared to what they would be if they were just increasing efficiencies from a baseline. As well. So there is a chance that we'd still have rebates, but they probably, would not look the same as they do today. But then that would have to go through a, a an extensive process at the PUC, right? Because you wouldn't change your rebate structure just for Denver. No, yeah, but we have, every two years we do file a plan. And with that, it does have to get approved every time. So I'm just, we don't know exactly the outcomes of it, but it's just something to think about coming up. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, next question comes from Elizabeth. Yeah, um, I actually think Antonia is making a good point because there is a whole section R503 uh, for alterations. And I know we've said that Energized Denver doesn't technically apply to single families, but there is a section in uh, the code that says that HVAC systems that are being replaced have to comply with R403, which is this. So, so this would apply to homes that are trying to replace their HVAC systems. So if that's not the intent, that there, then there should be a re revision within this language to address that. 
So the, the language in the proposal says space heating in new buildings and alterations are not new buildings. So it's only for new buildings, mm -hmm. I see. So not new construction, which would capture it with alterations, but new buildings specifically. New buildings, not new equipment. Mm -hmm. Cause that right. is a very and reasonable concern. If you think that additional clarification is needed in R503, that, that's possible. Um, maybe just a little bit, uh, cause there's a little bit in 503 about, um, uh, additions and inducting and things like that. So there, there might be a few extra words that are needed to, to make sure that that intent is fully carried through. Like if we're talking about an addition onto a house, that kind of thing, you know, if it's, if it's truly new standalone buildings and not just additions, you know what I mean? Yeah. Under the code an addition isn't considered a building. So, I mean, it's, uh, if, if we, if we wanted to put under exceptions, you know, additions and alterations, just to be painfully clear, um, that's being painfully clear is not always a bad thing in the code. Yeah, I, I like always that find idea. that, I always find the whole existing building section to be a little tricky to understand. So I, I think it's not a bad idea to add some clarification. It sounds like uh, some other people agree with that. Um, just in the interest of time, we'll move forward onto the next person, uh, which Nathan, I see your hand still up. I don't know if you had something new to add or not. Uh, apologies, no, I don't. Okay, good. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I know this is the question period. However, there is, you know, some of you did provide comments uh, during this period, that's fine. Uh, we will move quickly to the comment period. So if anybody had any further comments uh, that aren't questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. But it sounds like um, most of you may have already gotten those out during the question period. So uh, any new comments or any other discussion that wants to be had on this proposal? A reminder, next time we hear this, hopefully uh, there are some modifications. Sounds like there might be some modifications to it uh, to help you all get a better understanding. But now is your time to really hash this out or, or express your concern, and then we can hash that out uh, offline with, with the proponent as well. So any other further comments, raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we will close this item out of our business. Um, and we're, we're about the halfway mark. I'd like to go through the next one, but uh, just out of respect of everybody's time, we'll take an eight minute break. Uh, we'll do eight minutes because we have a lot, a lot to cover. Uh, feel free to turn off your cameras, do what you need to do. I'll set a timer and we'll see you in about eight minutes.
All right, if you can hear my voice, let's start making our way back. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, we'll move right into the next one. This is another one that we are not gonna be voting on, but uh, being introduced to the team. And Christine, I believe this one is yours as well, if you wanna take it away. It is mine as well, but since I already gave the overview for both of them, I'll pass it back over to Sean to go through the specifics. Thank you. <laughs> so this is, very similar to the previous. Um, and you see that it requires, uh, we'll, we'll start with what happens in R403.5. There's just a minor modification to allow an additional section. Um, so when it says this section, that means it's this section and all the subsections. And then we add this new section, R403.5.4, heat pump water heating keeping in mind the comment that we heard about the heat pump in the title might be applicable here too. And it says that service hot water in new buildings shall be provided by an electric heat pump system. Uh, so highlighting that this is new buildings, it does say service hot water because that's how the IECC defines it, even though I think most of us would consider this domestic hot water, but um, that is the word that is used in the code. And we do have a series of exceptions. Some of here necessary, some of here might not be necessary again, but we want just in case for clarity. So resistance heating elements integrated into the heat pump uh, storage. So most heat pump water heaters have an electric resistance coil in them that can be used in conjunction with the heat pump to boost recovery. Want to make sure that this doesn't seem like it's prohibiting it and certainly that it does not actually prohibit that sort of system. Um, it also exempts small water heaters. So the, the threshold of 20 gallons is, that's what you might call a pony water heater. Uh, some, and this would also capture instantaneous electric water heaters. So these you know distributed, very small volume water heaters where um, there really isn't a heat pump uh, model available anyway. And the energy usage is generally smaller so we want to exempt those just for practical purposes. Uh, with the same with the solar thermal systems, uh, the exemption, waste heat recovery systems, freeze protection systems, snow and ice melt systems. Technically, we probably don't need to include these exceptions, but they're included just for absolute clarity. Um, and you know, it's a fairly straightforward um, proposal and we, does the city have a follow up for this one as well? Uh, no, it's not. Right. So uh, yeah, like Christine says, we've, we've discussed some of the larger issues already. So this is a little bit shorter of an introduction. No, that's fine. Uh, we could use the time. <laughs> All right, so I'll go to the general public. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in support of this for two minutes, please raise your hand. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in support, please raise your hand. Third and final call, anybody from the general public that wants to speak in support? Seeing none, I'll go to opposition. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition, please raise your hand. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition of this proposal, please raise your hand. Third and final call, anybody that wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, I'll go back to the committee. Committee, this is your time to ask questions. Remember, we will have a discussion period uh, after the question period. So anybody that has questions for the proponent on this. Nathan, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm just thinking about this. Um, would the proponent be interested in an exception for um, small square footage tight space buildings where heat pump water heaters are just difficult to implement? 
No, I would say maybe 1,200 square feet or smaller. Um, so, uh, Christine, since you are the proponent, do you want to take a stab at that? I think that would be worth considering. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? no other questions i'll go to discussion uh courtney i see your hand up i guess it's more of a discussion based on the previous question um so the 1200 square feet i'd like to hear from uh sean or jan about if that's the right threshold i just think of 1200 square feet as maybe a new construction that wouldn't be so small um, of a home but it seems like a lot of homes are around that that square footage or they could be. Um, so I don't want to have a large exception if that's not the right threshold. So I'd just like to get some clarity on that. From a technical standpoint, I think dialing in what is that right threshold becomes very important. I think that that's something probably we would want to base on data coming from the building department. Uh, my sense is that a 1200 square foot home is probably fairly common. A 1200 square foot new home probably is not very common unless you're doing, you know, except for ADUs. Um, but I think having specific information from, from Denver building patterns is going to be the important part to help inform a threshold if you want to do a threshold. And I agree with Christine. I think that having that kind of threshold for a requirement like this, just entering the code is, is a reasonable one. All right, any, uh, any other discussion from the committee? Chuck. Just following up on that, I mean, I think um, the importance of, you know, setting a threshold is important, but I think it should be based more on the, I mean, obviously there's economic implications, but the capability or the volume needed by the water heater itself. And like, that should drive some of the, the volume limit um, thresholds that we exempt buildings from is the equipment itself. Um, and then I guess one follow-up question I have is on the exemptions. Just expand a little bit on the snow and ice melt systems. It, why are we exempting that? For clarity, um, because really, really those aren't service hot water, but we've seen confusion in other venues about how this would apply to these sorts of systems. So just to make sure that there is no confusion, that no, you don't have to use a heat pump water heater system for snow, freeze protection, or you know, the, for those systems when they do occur. Um, it, it really is just kind of a, a covering and clarity. All right, um, uh, next person that has their hand up is Chuck K. <clears throat> Yeah, again, um, it, it seems like our purpose should be to get off fossil fuels. Uh, you know, we're trying to get rid of greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution emissions. Um, and so we want to electrify and we want to electrify in the most efficient way possible. And of course, that means using a heat pump uh, where it makes sense over electric resistance heating. So when I see solar thermal again as an exception, a, a solar thermal hot water system uh, could certainly use electric resistance as a backup. Uh, you know, it's going to need some kind of backup. It's not going to provide 100 percent of the of the hot water. Uh, and so I, I'm a little concerned is because solar thermal is an exception. Are we sure that's not allowing a gas hot water heater as backup for um, a solar thermal hot water system? So since that seems to be a question, it wouldn't be allowed because only the solar thermal system is exempted, not a solar thermal backup system. I see. Okay, in that case, um, you know, one could argue, you know, as let's see, um, that in that case, uh, electric resistance backup might be sufficient as opposed to having to purchase a heat pump water heater. 
so in in that case it would depend on the size you know if if a really small amount of electric resistance backup is all that's necessary if it's below that 20 gallons then it would fall under that exemption if there is a need for it to be between 20 and 30 you know i think that that gets into fairly fine points um you know once you get to a 30 gallon electric resistance water heater you are talking about a 40 gallon heat pump water heater is i mean basic rule of thumb for equivalencies so it really would only be kind of that 20 to 30 range of electric resistance back up for a solar thermal yeah I, I guess i don't i don't know if the number of gallons is the appropriate metric in in the case of a solar hot water system because you 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 might have a large backup tank that you know 80 percent of the time would be heated by solar and a small percentage of the time would be heated mm -hmm. by electricity so I'm not sure the tank size is the right metric there. So you're talking about the, the when there's a larger storage tank that just has an electric resistance coil in it. And, and that it's not used that often, just during mm -hmm. a period of cloudy weather or whatever, you know, or snow. <clears throat> this is a fine point, but but I just thought I'd I'd bring it up. Thanks for bringing that up, Chuck. Um there there are there should be consideration when when this you hear this again whether or not that was taken into account uh but definitely everybody i would encourage to um you know voice your concern and opinions now but also uh get with the proponent to to make any modifications if you feel necessary uh so next person up is eric thank you mr moderator uh in addition to the um you know the additional volume that's necessary for uh, the heat pump water heater. Um, these are also quite a bit noisier. Um, and so I'd just like to hear a little bit of feedback uh, in terms of requiring uh, installation uh, for these in residential. Um, and quite quite frankly, the, the sound impact uh, associated with it, um, where a typical natural gas water heater is going to have <coughs> you know, three to five decibels of sound, we're going to have 10 times that with a heat pump water heater. I only have a sample size of one, but I haven't really noticed it being that much more noisy than, say, a refrigerator. Certainly quieter than a dishwasher. That will be a larger consideration for smaller homes, you know, that just don't have as much space to keep everything compacted together. Generally, um, the average noise from a heat pump water heater is the same as for, is about the same as from an average refrigerator. So it is a noise level that we are already tolerating in homes. Um, whether you know having an additional <laughs> source of of noise at that level is a concern, um, I, it's worth considering. But we are talking about a generation of heat pump water heaters that are by far quieter than the early generation ones that kind of inspired these concerns. All right, next up is Chuck B. Yes, um, and also just on exception number two, the electric water heaters under 20 gallons, how does this apply to instantaneous water heaters? So that would capture instantaneous because they have a storage volume of less than 20 gallons. So like if someone wanted to provide an instantaneous water heater that could serve an entire house, that would be allowed. I mean, that would be huge electric resistance and it's not an ideal situation, but. Um... Yeah, we, we've, we thought about that a little bit because while there is a technical loophole for that, and it's probably not a practical loophole, to, to try to do, I mean, at, at that point, if it's big enough to actually serve a house, then you're, that's an instantaneous electric boiler at that point. And it's so impractical that I'm not sure any buildings would actually do it. If, if you think that we need a specific, need to make sure that it's specifically addressed, uh, we could certainly do that. No, I could just see it being used as part of a 
to back up a solar thermal system or something like that, where they raise the incoming temperature of the water to the to the water heater, but it's still probably impractical. We could always change the storage volume to a KVA threshold. And then that covers both small storage water heaters and instantaneous water heaters. It would just take a little bit of market reconnaissance to find the right threshold for that. All right, next up we have Nathan. Uh, yeah, thanks. I think um, the the sound concern is a big issue, and that's why I think it's a the the thing that we found is not um, not so much sound off of the equipment, but potential vibrations from the equipment and what that's going to cause, and that can be minimized. But again, it's an installer education thing that most uh, most installers aren't aware of or prepared for, um, and then the. Um, Chuck, I have some experience with uh, an instantaneous whole house electric water heater. Had a builder looking to install one um, and uh, looked at, uh, I think it was going to take something like 140 amps to uh, service just the water heater. Um, so they were upgrading a service, um, putting in some substantial wiring and taking up a lot of their panel to make that happen. And it just made no sense um, for them anymore. Especially, I, I think even that system could only get, oh, something around 60 to 70 um, degrees of temperature rise at three gallons per minute. Um, so it's, it's a lot of electricity to do very little water heating. Oh. All right, next up we have Antonio. Thank you. Uh, mine's going to be the sound too, again. I, I mean, nobody said, uh, you know, around two decibels, but the research that I've been looking at is between 17 and 26 decibels up to 42 decibels. So, um, and even up to, I'm sorry, even some of them up to 60. So that is a concern. And um, the other question I would have, and I know this is uh, more conversation at this time, but um, we have a lot of north facing units, obviously, if we're building a row house, we have a, all our units facing the north that's gonna cause the units to activate more, thus running 23 and 24 hours a day again. So noise is a big one for me. It, do we have any statistics showing um, either way on, on with north facing units? Does anyone know that? I'm not aware of statistics that have looked at runtime for different units or for different orientations, runtime will be primarily driven by water, hot water usage, as opposed to, you know, just um, ambient conditions. Um, the, you know, the modeling that has been done doesn't, I don't think answers that question either. And how about the, the decibels? I know that we're, I'm sorry, go ahead, I interrupt you, go ahead. The units themselves aren't going to run more or less if the unit is north facing. So the, the water heater itself, okay. if it's in condition space, is going to run the same amount one way or the other because it's condition space. If it's in, in unconditioned space, unless for some reason your north facing units have thermostats programmed to lower the ambient temperature in the space, then yeah, you do know that because okay. conditioned space is conditioned space. Um, if they're in unconditioned space though, that might be different because a north facing um, space might actually experience lower temperatures than say a southeast or west facing space. And then what about the decibels? I know someone else commented that, oh, they're not that much louder. Do we have any statistics? Do we know exactly how many decibels? Do we know what they produce? I was just trying to look it up really quick and I can continue to try to look it up while you guys discuss. Awesome, thank you. I, I can provide a little bit of detail that uh, ACEEE and NBI did a study uh, on, on heat pumps and they, they, uh, they quote 49 decibels. Um, and for comparison, a refrigerator is around 40 to 45 decibels. Is that for heat pumps or heat pump water heaters? Heat pump water heaters. 
I think okay. I think the forty nine decibels is a is a, the Ream hybrid hot water heater, which that I is. Think is the quietest. It's the one I have, um, and I think some of the others are as much as maybe fifty five decibels. All right. Uh, next commentary uh, comes from Courtney. Or question. <laughs> this is a question. Um, so I would like to take a straw poll. Um, this would not be a vote in any way, but I just want to gauge the feeling of the intent or how the committee feels about the intent of these proposals. Like, do you find these that, that they're workable, that we can make modifications? I just want to see kind of where everyone's at. Um, and no way is this official. <laughs> sure. So uh, let me let me help. Uh, with that. So let's start with the heat pump and then we'll move to the heat pump water heater just so we have a, a lay of the land here. So anybody that if you feel comfortable with uh, and feel free not to raise your hand to you don't have since this is an official vote, um, but just kind of get an idea. If you're comfortable with that heat pump proposal and feel comfortable enough to raise your hand, go ahead and raise it. <laughs> And again, yeah, not, yeah, I just want to make it clear. It's not necessarily what's written on the screen, but comfortable about the intent. Sure. Okay, and let's let's go ahead and lower those hands. Uh, and I'll ask the same question with the heat pump water heater. If you're comfortable with uh, a heat pump water heater and, and feel comfortable enough raising your hand now, uh, not to vote, uh, go ahead and do so. So I think we had like four or five on the first one and we have roughly eight on this one. Cool. All right. Um, all the hands are down. Any other further discussion or comments or questions on this proposal? Nathan, go ahead. Um, I do have just an overall question um, about both this proposal and the previous one. Was there any thought on, um, and, and I've seen other municipalities do this, trying to um, incentivize electrification based on overall building efficiency requirements? Like for example, if you are all electric, you um, only have to meet a higher overall building efficiency requirement as opposed to a mixed fuel building, as opposed to saying we want to say, yes, you have to put in a, a water heater or a heat pump water heater or heat pump for HVAC. Um, yeah. So right now, the the efficiency requirements uh, proposals uh, is what I'll call them. But the you know how much additional efficiency Denver is going to require from buildings. Um, both of them have different levels for all electric versus mixed fuel. So that sort of incentivization is built into those proposals. Those proposals would need to be modified if mandatory or somewhat mandatory electrification went in for either space heating or water heating. Thanks, Sean. Okay, final call. Any other last comments, questions, or concerns on this proposal? Elizabeth, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I, su I support the concept, but I oppose the um, mandatory nature of it. I would rather fit this into the um, uh, incentive uh, application instead in a way that it goes into C4, or not C406, um, R, R408 or you know, all of those others in a way that there's still an option, but it's still gonna be the right choice for a lot of projects. And so there's just um, many things that, um, you know, I'm sure we haven't thought of and to, to still make it the most attractive option, um, but to allow it out when it isn't the right fit for a project. Also that keeps the door open for um, potential incentives. All right, next up is Chuck K. Sorry, had to unmute. Uh, Elizabeth makes very good points. Um, 
I guess my feeling is that unless we have mandatory requirements, you know, we're really not going to see change fast enough. <clears throat> you know, if you look at the at the Superior Fire, you know, a thousand families lost their homes. And if you look at the, the NOAA data on Colorado temperatures, that was a six month period of record high temperatures that led to that fire. So I, I think rather than, you know, make it incentive based, I think we have to come up with mandatory solutions, but maybe have exemptions or uh, or, or more details that clarify some of the, uh, uh, you know, reasonable uh, points that Elizabeth brought up. That, that's my opinion. All right, uh, Antonio, your hands up. You know, I was just going to say, uh, I was going to second uh, Elizabeth 100%. I, just, I, I feel like we're trying the hands of the Antonio, your uh, your your cell service or or internet service seems to be not very strong, and we can't hear you. Why, why don't you? We have another hand up, so why don't we we come back to you? We need to get rid of fossil fuels. Yes, these things are all great, but. We really unfortunately just, I cannot mute him. <laughs> uh, I'm trying. <laughs> okay, I put him in the waiting room. I'll put him back here in a minute. Um, next up is Ashley. Um, just echoing some of Elizabeth's concerns about. Um, potentially lowering the incentives and um, agreeing with the concept, but still having some reservations. I think personally, I'd feel a lot more comfortable um, if I had access to the cost data that you all are um, continuing to refer to. And I apologize, this is only my second meeting. So maybe there's a place where all of those studies and all of that data is stored that I could reflect on. Um, but I think that's a huge point for me is I really need to understand the numbers moving forward, being someone who builds affordable housing. Okay, so it sounds like that might be something uh, when this proposal comes back to the committee that maybe the proponent um, can provide with that. All right, Antonio, you are back. Let's see if your audio works. Go ahead. Let's try that. Can you everybody hear me now? I think that's, I think that's better. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I was just gonna second what Elizabeth was saying. She's 100% right on target. I, I, our, our deal here with the government is to give our citizens options, not obligations. And if we know that, but if we say, listen, we're just gonna blank, blanket statement, no more, and this is mandatory. I don't think that's a proper introduction and a fair introduction to our citizens and some of our people who have been citizens or in our area for a long length of time. So I, I think we need to kind of find an approachable way and maybe deviate a little bit from the wording of mandatory. All right, next up is Elizabeth. Um, yeah, just to expand on that and with the cost thing, um, there is a way to guarantee that, <laughs> that the heat pump systems are always going to be the less expensive systems. And, and that's uh, by making the gas systems um, more, uh, more rigorous. And, and that's where you all, this committee has the power in these other prescriptive options. And then, and then the statement that you know, heat pumps are going to be cheaper is it's going to be true and people will not only pursue it, but then the cost will con continue to come down as that availability uh, changes around. Um, but right now I, I, I disagree that it is uh, the less expensive choice. 
uh, today. Now it may be someday, but today it's not. Uh, until we change the code to, to make it the more attractive option. But we have that power to do so. Ken, you're up next. I guess I personally don't find it that onerous. I, I do believe the heat pumps are gonna be a little bit pricier, especially in your, you know, your more simplified single family homes or single units. Um, I think one out that might be something for the group to consider um, so that we at least push it into electric is maybe give a little bit of flexibility on exception two. Um, you know, maybe push that up to 30 gallons so you would cover your smaller spaces. I mean, reality is that 20 gallon mark, um, you know, I can get some pretty big water heaters, 20 gallons and under if I start to slide into the light commercial line. So that's an easy one to get around. So we might as well make it 30 gallons. Uh, the good news is, is that that provides the power ready for five, 10 years down the road when they maybe swap out for a heat pump. I think that would be a great way to move it all electric and kind of be a stepping stone and, and eliminate gas with not necessarily having the, the cost of the, the heat pump. Um, obviously electric water heaters are very, very, very cost effective. I mean, a fourth of the cost, if not, then you can buy them off the shelf for $500. So <laughs> that's my thoughts. All right, so uh, we, will, we will close this item out for the sake of conversation online, but um, I do wanna encourage you all especially those who are comfortable with this and, and even those that aren't comfortable with this to reach out to Christine, who is the proponent uh, and work with her. Um, this, this is now your time between now and the next time we hear this uh, to get it tailored to how you may want it to see, may, may want it to be written um, and, and come to an agreement so that uh, potentially that this can be something that passes, you know, something that maybe you're comfortable with. So if you're comfortable and or uncomfortable, uh, reach out to Christine and, and, and start those conversations. So with that, I'll close this one out um, and we'll move to the next item of business. The next item of business is item number 31. Uh, I'm supposed to be turning it over to Eric <laughs> to discuss how we are going to handle the next two items, but maybe Courtney or Christy um, knows how we're going to do this. I don't know if we're actually going to be voting on 31 and 47 today. Uh, I think Eric alluded to that we were not, but uh, when do you guys want to jump in? Yeah, we can speak to that. Um, so the thought is that we won't vote on these today either. We'd like to have as much conversation as possible. And so similar to the other proposals, we'd like to get through the discussion. If the committee thinks that we're moving in a good direction, then we could certainly say, okay, well, maybe we do wanna take a vote, but we'd like to more focus on the conversation and just advancing that dialogue and figuring out if there are things that need to be adjusted so that we have the opportunity to make adjustments before we have the vote kind of in line with the intro discussion that um, Eric kicked off with. Okay, great. So we will, um... Pull up item number 31, and Robbie, I believe that is yours. Uh, so <clears throat> let's give us a, a brief uh, summary of this, and we will run it through as if we just did the last two. We'll get public comments for two minutes, and then we'll go back to the committee. Yeah, I think we had a, a really good discussion um, last time uh, we were all together uh, speaking to this amendment. and. It was uh, changed and presented uh, as changed. Um, They're modified uh, per, per this discussion that we had before. Uh, so really the importance of this um, uh, proposal is to um, establish a viable energy rating uh, index compliance alternative pathway. Uh, currently it, it is a option uh, as well as any of the other compliance options uh, to choose from, uh, but it's been changed to, um, first of all, not mandate uh, solar in, in any way or re on-site renewables in any way, and to have a single um, index score of 50 that you have to achieve or go, beyond, go below. Uh, the other kind of important thing that it did was it, um, uh, X out the ventilation uh, amendment that happened in the body of the national code uh, there, which caused the energy rating index scores 
not to be in alignment with the ResNet HERS energy rating index scores, uh, thus making the index uh, in alignment with those score with the with the HERS ResNet energy rating index, and um, which which the majority of the builders that are doing energy ratings uh, largely for marketing, but they're using the ResNet HERS index rather than the IECC one. So uh, there's, there's great alignment in that there. Um, the only other thing that I can think of to, to remind us about is that the, the score being set at 50 um, creates a backstop um, and that and the backstops that were um, written into the body of the code in on the national uh, 2021 IECC um, have been removed so that um, this gives builders uh, greater flexibility to determine the specifications that they want to use in order to achieve that index score of 50 or less there. So this this uh, compliance path, uh, the hope is that this compliance path will be used more often uh, so that in the future, um, potentially uh, this compliance path can be used as a better metric and guide to bring the city down to its uh, ultimate 2030 goal um, there. So that, that's all Thanks. I have to say right now. Thanks, Robbie. And I believe we, the committee has heard this proposal before, correct? Yes, and and you had made you had you had taken those suggestions uh, from the committee and made some changes on that. Yes, we presented it once. Uh, we and made changes uh, modifications based off of that original discussion. Uh, we've already we've presented it a second time uh, with those changes, uh, and then uh, this would be the third time that they're seeing it uh, now. Okay, great. So. Uh, with that being said, I will not go back to public comment then, uh, since we've already had rounds for that, uh, and just open it up to the committee now for, uh, let's start with questions only, and then we'll move to discussion. So any, any further questions from the committee on this proposal? Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I think you touched base with this last time, but I, I don't recall. Why did we eliminate the, the thermal envelope backstops? Yeah, so the, the thermal envelope backstop is not needed because of the, the threshold energy rating index score that's required. Um, when you're doing an energy rating index and you're trying to get it to a, a score of 50 or below without the use of on-site renewables, um, there, you you are automatically have to have a sound building thermal envelope that's uh, that's in the same range as where the back backstop was, and you also have to have uh, sound and efficient mechanical systems uh, in the home there. So the score itself becomes the backstop uh, because it's set at the fifty threshold there, and it's requiring that threshold be met without using on-site renewable energy. All right, next question comes from Nathan. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think through the practicality of this. Um, uh, and so you're saying that this will be linked to the ANSI ResNet 301, the latest version? No, that, that that's been uh, that's been struck there. It's just the ANSI. It's making it clear that it's the ANSI ResNet 301 standard that you're using, just like the IACC is using it uh, to generate the index score. Uh, the big thing that's been removed is the ventilation amendment that was in the body of the code, and uh, that's what caused the uh, the those two scores to. Um, diverge from each other. Oh, I'm I'm asking if it's re referencing a specific um, in, uh, uh, adoption of that ANSI ResNet ICC 301. Is it the 20, is it 2014 or 2019? Is it 
Um, currently, it's it's not referencing a specific one. The 2021 IACC in the um, appendix, I, it's maybe not an appendix, but it's a chapter that has all the listings of the um, of the standards and the version of the standards that are used uh, in quarterly with with all the uh, requirements and all the standards. Uh, it's currently referencing the 2019 version of 301. Um, the 2022 version of uh, ANSI 301 is uh, just about to be published. And so depending on when the city, when we get to that point, uh, we might want to make reference to the 2022 version. All right, next question comes from Chuck K. Um, so you are allowing the HERS score to be met uh, with the inclusion of rooftop solar, right? The, there, um, uh, let me see if we, there's, you're allowed to use 5% of that. So if you look at uh, the paragraph that's right above um, R406.4 there, uh, five only five percent of the on-site renewable energy can be used to help you achieve the energy rating index of fifty. There, huh. uh, because I mean the primary reason for that is that um, uh, the energy rating index system is designed to be able to evaluate the efficiency of all the components that are associated with the house and it turns out that on-site renewables can lower that score um, a lot there but the philosophy of building a zero energy home is to maximize your thermal envelope efficiencies maximize your um, your mechanical efficiencies that gets you in the range of 35 and 40 that's the lowest you can get if you're if you are maximizing those things, the rest of it is made up by on-site renewables. So again, going back to the backstop question, where the the energy code is always trying to protect the building thermal envelopes to ensure that you're not, in essence, trading off renewable and uh, using renewables to trade off a really poorly performing building thermal envelope, and th this this does that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. You don't want to trade off a poor envelope, uh, but there are some cases where you reach a point of diminishing returns on envelope improvement, envelope improvements, and and adding rooftop PV can be more cost effective. Correct? Yes. When you get when you're if if the score was set at thirty five, that that might be an issue. But being set at fifty, we're not at that point of diminishing returns yet. I see. Okay. Thanks. All right, any other questions? Third and final call for questions. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a, a question going back up to the top for the additional energy efficiency um, for the performance portion of it. It looks like it's modified. The original base code said one package or 95% of the standard reference design, but now it's been modified to the same one package or 77% of the standard reference design. Um, it seems like there's been some inequality created there with those two choices. I can talk about that one. I think part of what we're seeing here is trying to address the different paths and different proposals. So the, the 77 that calibrates the modeling path to the ERI path, the proposal that we're talking about next, which is R408, um, further modifies this. So it would modify that 2.1 um, to, to calibrate that then prescriptive path and R408 to the same level of performance. So it wouldn't be a package at all anymore. It would be the points in the next proposal. Mm -hmm. I got it. Okay, seeing no more questions, we'll open it up for discussion now. Any further discussion from the committee on this? 
Mike, I see your hand up, but I think you, I'll, I'll, I don't think you, I'll lower it for you if you want. There you go. Uh, any other discussion from the committee? So as Christy mentioned, we, we were not really trying to plan on voting on this uh, today, I don't believe. So uh, I guess we, we need to get a lay of the land of a temperature to see how people are on this to know if we will vote on it today though. So unofficially, uh, like we did on the last one, uh, if you're if you're comfortable voting on this, uh, go ahead and raise your hand just so we know if we should call a vote or not. Um, it doesn't sound like we we only have one hand, so it doesn't sound like we have we we are there to that point. So uh, I want to make sure that you all are get to a point where you're comfortable to vote on this one way or another. So um, being that. This was supposed to be uh, the time to, to have some of that conversation um, and, and there's no more conversation to be had that I see. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to get with Robbie between now and the next time. And maybe that's just because you want to hear the next proposal or the next one that it's tied to. So that's fine, too. But um, anyway, let's move forward. Courtney, I do see your hand up. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I guess I just have a question. Um, I would love to hear from committee members um, like what you would like to hear more of or what would make you feel comfortable for voting um you know we want to answer all the questions you have and i just um want to make sure we know those questions so if anyone wants to speak to that I, i'm or send me an email i'm open to that as well thank you yeah that's a good point um we all have our normal lives after this <laughs> it might just get forgotten about so uh, let's get it out there if you have anything. Okay, seeing that no one's comfortable saying that uh, line, feel free and please, I encourage you to reach out to uh, other people on the committee too to, to discuss that. Uh, so with that being said, I will close this one out um, and we'll, we'll bring up item number 47, which Sean, I believe this one's yours. Um, you want to give us, and I believe this is the same situation where we're not going to vote on today unless people feel strong enough to vote today. So please give us an overview of 47. Sure. I'm going to go ahead and bring it up. Loading. Sorry about that. So this proposal, while it's loading, I'll just go ahead and start talking. <laughs> this, this proposal addresses uh, the level of performance through efficiency that would be required of um, residential buildings in Denver through the prescriptive path. And there are really two main things that this proposal does. One is that it replaces the package structure from the original from 2021, which is now, uh, as you probably remember, Denver adapted, adopted a package structure for its 2019 code um, ahead of, not ahead, but has, so there was already a, this package approach in 2019. This replaces that with an accredited approach like we see in the commercial code. And the reason for this is that a credit approach allows uh, homes to get to much higher levels of performance in a prescriptive manner since instead of being a blunt tool of, you know, here's three, four, five, six options, each of them have to achieve at least a certain amount of savings, but there's no differentiation between them. It's really a blunt approach to additional efficiency. This is a more refined approach. It allows the, the approach to really have a fine-tuned level of credit that is given for each efficiency option that is concerned, that is uh, that is created. And then the other thing that this proposal does is that it calibrates that performance level to Denver's goals from the implementation plan. And so the number of credits that are in this right now for being required for residential buildings is based on the number of credits that would have to be uh, achieved to meet Denver's implementation plan uh, with one note that since you have already adopted a couple of proposals into the main body of the code, this 18 would need to be calibrated down 
if you wanted to meet the implementation plan goal, because uh, 18 on top of that would actually get you past the implementation plan goal just for efficiency. Um, we've been looking at these charts that kind of have it a more holistic view, but the implement implementation plan did have individual um, goals set for performance, electrification, and renewable energy. As we look at the structure itself, if you can go down to the table, Um, so we worked with Earth Advantage, who is who runs the uh, an above code program for residential constructions, uh, the Earth Advantage program, and the modeling for this is all based on a 2021 IECC building prototype, and each of these options were uh, modeled separately. And so we've discussed this so far, I think, went into the, the methodology, and I don't think we need to belabor it by going into it again. But this, all of these point values are based on modeling. Unlike in commercial, the point values are roughly equivalent to 1% savings as, to, as opposed to a quarter of a percent savings. So that's one difference as you're kind of keeping both of those in mind. And if you can go ahead and scroll down to the bottom of this table. Um, these two last items are something that I think are really relevant to the discussion that we had earlier and that the city has been having internally. And that's um, how electrification gets incorporated into this because electrification has both an efficiency component and a carbon component from Excel's decarbonizing grid. So this proposal does two things. All electric buildings only need to achieve three credits from this section. And so that places them at the efficiency level of essentially IECC 2021. No, you know, no higher. So the 18 points, 18 credit requirement is really only for mixed fuel buildings. Um, so that creates an incentive, an incentive for all electric construction if either of the elect mandatory electrification proposals go through, there will probably need to be some kind of modification to that uh, just to accommodate the fact that we're not getting as much benefit out of an all electric building if it's only getting you know, from partial electrification to full electrification. There are two options for partial electrification. So that's electric space heating and electric water heating. And Probably the big open question right now is where those credit levels should be placed to provide, to have this kind of incentivization that we're talking about for, we want to incentivize partial electrification over no electrification, but also incentivize full electrification over partial electrification. And then as we discussed before, the, the rest of this section is really just all the actual requirements that you need to meet to, to get the credits. We have tried to structure this as much as possible so that it reflects the, the credit approach that's already in C406 for 2021, just so that there's consistency. We understand that sometimes that maybe the market overlap between practitioners for the residential and commercial code may not be huge, but it does exist. And so that consistency will help just with understandability of this code section. Thanks, Sean. Uh, with that being said, since uh, we are not necessarily voting on this today, I'll, I'll still ask the general public if anybody wants to speak in support of this proposal, please raise your hand. If anybody wants to speak for, or in support of this proposal, please raise your hand. Third and final call, anybody from the general public that wants to speak in support? Seeing none, I'll go to opposition. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition of this, please raise your hand. Anybody from the general public that wants to speak in opposition, please raise your hand. Third and final call, anybody wants to speak in opposition? Seeing none, okay, I'll turn it back over to the committee. Committee, this is your time for questions uh, about this proposal. We, we will have a comment section, so keep that in mind. Uh, any, any questions from the committee on this proposal? Mike, go ahead. Yeah, this kind of goes back to the, the same question I just asked about changing the uh, performance section and the additional energy efficiency. Again, this would get changed to whatever point values calibrated to 77%. Um, but I guess my question would be, um, 
isn't the standard reference design a function of the U factor tables that we changed with the uh, the prescriptive modifications we've already passed? Um, so if if the standard res reference design is already getting more restrictive based on that, and then we're asking them to do 77% of that, are we double dipping and in fact making it uh, less of an option than the prescriptive path? I think it might be a question for Robbie to answer how the baseline in 406 relates to those tables. Yeah, so um, R406 is um, not using the standard reference design that the R405 pathway is using. Uh, R406 is using the reference home uh, that's built in the ResNet ANSI ICC um, standard 301. No, I'm sorry. I must. I may have misspoke. I was asking about the performance path. Ah, well, then that is a question for me. So the the percentage, just like the number of credits in R four hundred eight, would need to be calibrated. Um, the percentage for R four hundred five would need to be cal calibrated as well. So this would become, you know, whatever whatever level of efficiency the committee feels is the appropriate level to recommend recommend. We would need to get that level of efficiency translated into each of the the compliance paths to make sure that there's some rough, you know, that there's basic equivalency between them. And that would also then need to account for whatever goes into the main body of the code, um, because that will not only adjust the target that we'll need to go for in especially 405 and 408. Um, but we will also need to take a look at some of the credits available for some of the options in R408 because they might be degraded based on the proposals that have gone into the main body of the code. So especially you know, some of these envelope proposals, um, envelope options, we might need to lower the credit values based on how the base, uh, the main body of the code has already come up. Okay, any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, I'll move to the, the discussion portion. So this is your time to discuss this proposal um, and uh, get it, you know, ask the questions and concerns that get it to a point where you will vote on it one way or the other. No discussion. Everybody wants to vote then, huh? <laughs> All right, I'll ask a, a second time. Anybody, any further discussion on this proposal? Is it clear, clear as can be? And third and final call, uh, any final discussion? Okay, uh, again, just to kind of get the lay of the land here, now that you've seen both of those proposals, uh, is it, do you, who would feel comfortable voting today on this one? This is not an official vote, but raise your hand if you would feel comfortable voting on this. One way or the other. Right, it doesn't have to be for uh, acceptance, but it could be for rejection as well. Maybe anybody feel comfortable on that? A couple hands, so not not quite. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so I, I do challenge you then and ask you the question: What would make you get to, the, to that point of being comfortable on voting? Um, that might be a rhetorical question, but uh, keep that in mind. Um, I'll close this out for the sake of time because. I don't want to start a new uh, new proposal with less than 20 minutes, and we have 22 minutes, so I'll close that out just so we are there. But before we do, Erica, I just want to make sure we still got quorum there. Um, and while while I pull that up and while you check on quorum, uh, I'll pull up item number 10, which I believe is NBI again, or John. I see John has joined, so. Um, but before we do that, it looks like Elizabeth has her hand up. Yeah, Kevin, I just wanted to answer your question about, um, you know, what it takes to make us all feel comfortable <laughs> to 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 vote on things. It's uh, I don't know about everybody else, but you know, there there's a lot here, and I know we're all still trying to get our arms wrapped around these these big amendments, and they're so intertwined that I. I don't want to speak for everybody else, but I feel like I, I just need to get to know them. And I, you know, I've read them, I've done my homework and I don't really have any questions, but I really like to hear the discussion 
uh, around all of these things because everybody brings such a different perspective. And I just want to make sure that that gets, um, uh, I guess, you know, fully discussed. And if that means we circle back to to things, you know, now that we can visualize how things get related, I, that that helps me a lot. So that's why I haven't been raising my hand. I think that's a thanks for bringing that up. That that feedback helps uh, everybody. Because now, what now we know? We all right. Before we vote on something, everybody wants to know how this is all going to be laid out. I think that's good feedback. Thank you. All right, so we're right at twenty minutes. Let's start this. Uh, hopefully, we can get through this uh, one. Item number ten. Uh, I don't. I don't know if Sean, if you're going to uh, give us a summary on this, or if John's going to give us a summary on this. This one is for me to help with. Um, so the okay. next, the next series of proposals are all meant to help Sorry with- Sorry to interrupt, Sean. I do want to just state oh. before we continue that we do not have quorum anymore. We are at 14 MIDI members instead of 16. Okay, well, that solves things. I, I'm glad we asked. <laughs> uh, it, we, we didn't need a uh, quorum up until this point. So, but, um, so with that being said, we will uh, table the rest of the agenda uh, unless the city feels that it's um, important or a good use of our time to hear the next couple items, uh, since we have some time, even though we don't have quorum, we, we wouldn't vote on it. But uh, if we just want to hear a first round through, Courtney, go ahead. Yeah, I'd be open to hearing some some feedback on if we want to hear the next few that plug into C four hundred six, or if we want to hear some information um, more like explanation around C406, which is very similar to our 408, but on the commercial side. Um, I'd like to hear some feedback or Chrissy, I'll, I'll pass it to you and what your opinion is. I'm totally good with that. And so happy for that feedback. I was just also going to kick back to um, Eric's comments at the beginning of the hearing and just say that if we do have a few minutes and anybody has some thoughts that they would like to share in the conversation setting about process as we're considering moving forward, we're not asking you for the answer, but if there's something that you wanna share with us that you think would be worthwhile for us to consider, then we would welcome hearing that as well. Yeah, definitely, I think that's good. So um, don't, wanna, don't wanna pass up that opportunity. So feel free to raise your hand if you wanna give future feedback, feedback for the future, but um, also know that we will stay on the line after uh, all this as well to, to hear that too, if you wanna wait. So with, with all that being said, let's, uh, you know, let's hear, thank you for staying on. Let's hear, let's start getting introduced to these next items in C406 so you can start wrapping your head around some of these. So the next five proposals are all similar in a way, and I want to start with what these five proposals are meant to do and how they re relate to this larger C406 proposal. So the larger C406 proposal uh, does two things. It collapses all those tables that are in C406 now for the credit approach into a single table because you're a single climate zone. You don't need all those tables. But the bigger thing that it does is that it calibrates C406 to meet Denver's goals, recognizing that there are a limited number of credits available in IECC 2021. There are these five proposals that are separate from that, and these are all meant to create additional credit options within C406. So all of these, they do not change the stringency of C406. That happens in the other proposal. These are all meant to just create a, either additional efficiency options or additional um, flexibility within the options. So we'll start with the first one, which is the credit for um, premium cooling in C406. The existing C406 places a cap on the number of credits that you can get for additional cooling efficiency, and it caps it at 15%. So uh, right now, there's a way to scale those credits upward from the 10% in the basic to this 15% level. Um, this removes that cap, recognizing that one, we have equipment that is more efficient 
out there on the market today. And also that the 15% limit that was put into the IECC was a little bit artificial because it was just, that was the one that PNNL modeled. So this just eliminates the limit. You can now scale up for that very efficient cooling equipment and get additional credit points. Um, just as a note, Colorado's climate being what it is, um, with the amount of cooling that is actually needed. I mean, it's especially in commercial buildings, there is still cooling needed. Um, but you know, this may not be a huge um, adder going up to that very high efficiency, but it does at least open the door. So do you wanna, do we want to go to uh, number 12 then, or do you want to do each one of these individually? I mean, it's Whichever way the committee just going off of, yeah, I was going off the feedback of maybe hearing all the things first before we, we know what we're voting on, on, on any one of these. Okay. Well, let's do that. Since we're not voting anyway uh, today, let's open up item number 12. All right. So this one is similar and I think the right one may not have gotten posted for 12. Oh, it did. Okay. So no, I'm sorry. It didn't. The, the intent of this one is to allow for additional credits for infiltration above the base code. Um, so I will just describe it conceptually. There was a little bit of an issue with this one just because Denver has in the past gone beyond the IECC base code in its infiltration testing requirements. So we needed to coordinate this one with those requirements to make sure that it all works correctly. Um, so we'll just say conceptually, uh, th there are buildings that don't have to do the testing in the base code, and there are buildings, and there is the opportunity to go beyond what the base code would require, and this would provide additional credits for that. So I think we'll make sure that that link gets fixed and see what happened, and then we can, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, next one is 16, I believe. All right, and this one is similar. Right now in C406, you can get credit for reducing your total envelope UA by 15%. This creates another tier above that. And you'll see this is kind of a, a pattern that we're saying there's, there's, you know, better performance, even better performance. And so it creates a separate set of credit options if you reduce it 25% below the base code UA instead of just the 15%. Um, you know, this is, this one is based on best estimates of what the savings would be. So if you, if you notice that the amount of infiltration reduction is more than the amount of credit increase because there is a certain amount of diminishing returns that happens with infiltration reduction that is similar to installation. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm still thinking of the last one of infiltration. There is uh, diminishing returns that happen with adding more and more installation to the building. So that's that concept. Okay, we can so then I think the, the last one. one is 101. And okay. this one creates credit options for partial electrification of buildings. So we saw something similar in R408. Since R408 is an all new um, approach to R408, and those credits are being newly addressed, that partial electrification is in the main R408 proposal. But this one is just adding partial electrification credits to C406 as it stands. 
And so we've got additional for either electric space heating or electric water heating so that you can get credit for, for partial. I did wanna highlight one thing, that last column is other occupancies. And because what happens, what you get from partial electrification varies so much from building type to building type, we really didn't have a basis for establishing credits for just other occupancies as a blanket, um, which is unfortunate, but I feel it's, it's a more defensible approach because you don't wanna give you don't want to under credit or over credit buildings for partial electrification. Um, I suppose it would be possible to just say, you know, what's the worst case scenario in any building type and just I think we lost Sean's audio. Uh, anybody? Okay, I see in head nods. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, we'll give that. Um, we'll give Sean a minute to maybe try to restart his computer. But um, I think that was a good introduction for a few of those. I don't think. I mean, we still have other ones in that section. But uh, up until this point, 10, 12, 16, and then the beginning of 101. Uh, I want to go ahead and open it up to the committee for any questions or comments. You know, this time, since this is all time to get familiar with these and get your questions out there. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns uh, on these items? Chuck K, go ahead. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask a question about air infiltration. Of course, um, you know, from energy conservation standpoints, we've made buildings, you know, tighter and tighter. Um, but with COVID concerns and, and concerns that in fact, um, what we've seen with COVID, uh, you know, may be not be the end of pandemics. We may see others in the future. Uh, we might see a trend toward basically uh, increasing the number of air changes per hour, but you know, with proper either uh, uh, heat recovery or enthalpy recovery. So I'm just wondering to what extent, um, you know, is is biologically protecting indoor air coming into play as we as we look at these air leakage standards just a question so this is robbie i think i might be able to address that since sean uh, isn't on um so there there are two um related issues but uh, also not related so um air tightness uh, is important from an efficiency perspective from a building performance perspective from a building science perspective um, but ventilation is the key from the health perspective and the perspective that you're talking about with regards to COVID and, and whatnot. So we yes. still want to get the house or the building, in this case, uh, being commercial uh, driven proposal here, uh, as tight as we possibly can so we can gain control and predictability of that airflow through the building uh, and then introduce the proper amount of ventilation uh, and also filtration uh, to address the um, health and COVID concerns that you're, you're addressing. Okay, th yes, that makes sense. Uh, I guess a related question is, I think the, uh, uh, the airflow direction in a building would play a very important role in protecting people. For example, if you had a floor to ceiling upward ventilation, um, that would protect, uh, reduce the amount of transmittance of a virus from one person in an office building to another. Are there any considerations being given to the actual uh, ventilation flow paths? Um, you know, yeah, to be I, honest, I, I'm not sure on the commercial side um, that ventilation, but I know that ventilation would be, be considered in a different proposal than this premium air tightness proposal number 12. So, uh, it, that question is a, is a great question, but it should be brought up uh, at, at a different time, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say with regards to that last question, I've, I've, um, I don't recall what the Denver code has as far as ventilation efficiency or effectiveness, but uh, many years ago, I've tested uh, displacement ventilation system. So I know those can be um, sometimes effective at uh, mitigating 
transmission of contaminants. Uh, I'm not an IEQ expert, so I can't uh, speak to how well um, it may, you know, address direct COVID concerns. Um, but I, I think as far as, um, you know, certainly there are means to uh, ensure adequate ventilation, uh, heat recovery to promote energy efficiency. I, I think one thing that could be considered probably for Denver is as people move to uh, dedicated outside air systems to make sure that those are designed perhaps with a little bit of buffer such that if, if you know, they're not just designing for the bare minimum, but if they need to, um, you know, that they can increase uh, ventilation levels, so. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is Chuck B. Yeah, I just um, wanted to address Chuck K. No, uh, I'm on the Mechanical Plumbing Code Committee as well, and there aren't any specific code amendments to address um, COVID currently. Obviously, it's a big topic that is, you know, get on ASHRAE's website and they have a whole area dedicated to possible solutions. There is um, possible green code to require um, better filtration, like at a MERV 13, but um, currently like air direction, additional volume, et cetera. Currently in Denver, we don't have amendments to address that, just right off. Um, and talking about the proposals, 101, Sean was talking about the, well, there's no credits available to these other occupancy buildings because it's just not data available for those. And I find that concerning because there's a large potential that we're not going to be treating those buildings equitably, like high energy use buildings, like a restaurant would fall into that other occupancy category. And I, I think it's too bad that they can't get credits for going electric. Um, so I, I just find that concerning that, you know, it's not like the one-off occupancy that we never see. That's like all A occupancies will fall into that other category. Um, S and F occupancies, uh, depending on the, the type, could definitely uh, adjust to energy use. But the, just the A occupancies, I, I find concerning not being included in this table and have the partial electrification credits. Thanks, Chuck. Um, we, we do have about two minutes left. Uh, I want to be respectful for everybody's time. But um, again, I'll, I'll stay on as long as, as we want for any feedback too. But uh, I, I do want to wrap up the introduction of these four items, the 10, 12, 16, and 101. We will hear those again, but uh, wanted to get a quick introduction of those since we have some time. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I'm going to stop the hearing. I'll stop the recording. Feel free to hop off. Uh, but we will leave it open for any further commentary on processes or any anything like that, any feedback you might have. So thanks, everybody. I know today was a little bit uh, different than uh, our normal hearings in, in terms of the process, but I think this is, a, like I said before, it's a, a true testament to the city and their efforts to try to make sure that everybody is heard. Um, so thanks, for, thanks, everybody, for being flexible on that, and we'll see you next time.